You've tuned in to I Am Not a Number Live, the review show with Cardinal Sin and friends, where we review a different episode of The Prisoner starring Patrick McGuhan. Each week, we discuss a different episode and its implications then and now. Follow along and make sure to catch the episode in our viewing order so you can be ready to ask questions and participate in the chat. New episodes premiere each week on Wednesdays from 3 to 5 Central. The show's surreal and political implications on the reduction of the individual to a number have an even more insidious impact today, as all of our information, phone calls, texts, likes, photos, and other data are harvested to be sold and turn us into product rather than consumers. Get ready for a deep dive into one of the most important shows to have an impact on pop culture and society ever. And remember, I am not a number. Welcome, welcome followers. It is I, Cardinal Sin. And with me today are Ari, Yvonne, and Rick the Unmutual. How are you guys doing? Hey, great, thanks. Enjoyed the movie. It was a great movie. Great, glad to be here. remember it, to be honest. Yeah, it was different from how I remembered it, too. I haven't seen it in a long time. No, I haven't seen it in probably... I've owned the DVD for probably 10 years, but probably haven't watched it for 20. Um, And it was... I, I remember it being very dull, but it was less dull than what I remember it being. I actually quite enjoyed it. I, I think uh, they could have used to, you know, shorten it by half an hour, but. I haven't watched it as many times as Howard Hughes did, but uh, <laughs> but I have, I do watch it. Yeah, about once a year or so, maybe, maybe once every other year. I don't know. But apparently, if you lived in Las Vegas at a, at a certain time in history, the TV station that uh, Howard Hughes owned played it constantly because he kept asking for them to show it again. Huh. Interesting. I saw it recently on TV, um, just you know, a month, two months ago, something like that. Um, so it was fairly fresh in my mind. Was it different uh, substantially from what we just watched? I I don't remember. Um, so many so many spy movies that I've seen end like that that uh you, you know they kind of all run together in a certain certain way it's uh kind of generic the ending yeah it's the uh, everybody wins kind it's of a, ending it's, I a guess, day, it's a detente ending which or at least you nobody should expect from that era yeah perfect yeah yeah absolutely uh it does get a bit sort of muddy in places but even so i still i still really enjoyed it i i felt the performances of everybody were better than I remember. I remember Rock Hudson as being very limp, but he was actually better than I remember him, to be fair to him. But Magoo and I still think absolutely biased though I am, that kind of acts them all off the uh, the stage with a very theatrical performance. It's a film that lends itself well to a kind of theatrical performance because it's all very enclosed and, 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 and so on. So um, I think it suited Magoo and, and the way he, he performs. Um, but I'm even less convinced david jones is john drake from danger man having seen it again i've always been a bit iffy about this but now i've seen it again there's no way they're the same character yeah. and even less even less their number well, six that's been my position all along um, and you are quite correct drake is right. very much the white knight despite the fact in the first episode he's sent to assassinate an assassin he's still very much the white knight character throughout the series and uh jones is the more of a late 60s very cynical spy more lifted than from anything having to do with danger man yeah and as we mentioned in the um in in the chat while the film was going on drake is essentially a, a a pleasant decent man i don't get the impression that david jones is is particularly pleasant you know he boasts about having killed people drake right, would never exactly. have boasted about that sort of thing yeah. exactly exactly um so, uh, Bill, do you feel that 
do you feel any any the wiser as to why people link McGowan McGowan's characters together so much other than the fact that it's the same actor it, it does get a bit tiresome doesn't it that everyone he ever plays is supposedly the same character with a different false name in in the movie uh as in the prisoner uh he seems to be angry and and hostile which i i think is somewhat the same as uh the prisoner um you know, they, they do have that, that similarity. Absolutely, he hmm. has that uh, that scowl and you know, forceful nature uh, that John Drake wouldn't have, but I think the prisoner would. It's almost as if this was this uh, the assignment in Ice Station Zebra was the last straw, and after this, it's like that's it. I'm resigning. I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I I will say that um, I still my position on John Drake is still that the prisoner is John Drake and that the main reason they never say that and they never mention it and why for years after they wouldn't explicitly say so was a matter of rights. Yep. Mm. Yeah. I I've all, I, my personal view is I've always felt that's a red herring because the prisoner mm. was the most expensive TV show ever produced. Lou Grade had already got the rights to do another s series of danger man. Mm. If McGowan had gone to him and said, I want to do a series about John Drake resigning and being imprisoned in a village there's no way lou grade wouldn't have said you can you know you can have the rights he, of course he would have done it would absolutely let him have the rights in a second um, and it would have cost pennies compared to the rest of the, the show so i i personally have, have never believed that i think i think mcgoon wanted to do something different the whole reason the prisoner got made is that he was totally bored of playing danger man why would someone totally bored of playing danger man go i'm gonna do another series of danger man but just not call it that i i i well I, well, there's, I think the other issue uh, with why he quit Danger Man was the the last two episodes are a James Bond film, and he was clear that he didn't want to play James Bond. Yeah, very true, and, and that's awful as well, to be fair. It's not even a good James Bond film, is it? Yeah. Essentially, the last two episodes are a ripoff of You Only Live Twice. I mean, there's some, a lot of differences. Uh, sure. Danger Man? Yeah. yeah. There are two color episodes that take place in Japan. And if right. you didn't know better, you'd think somebody was trying to copy You Only Live Twice. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, you know, uh, the the performance, you know, definitely wasn't a Sean Connery type of performance. I tell you what I liked about Ice Station Zebra more again more than I remember, and, and Ivan can tell us something about the production. I think um, I thought I thought the submarine shots were fantastic, and I thought the score was brilliant. The music was much better than I ever remember it being. Really good score. I know at one point I did have the vinyl of it, but it's one of those things I think I owned for the sake of owning it rather than sitting there and putting it on the turntable. But I, the score was much better than I remember. I think this. I think this movie is 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 actually not a bad film. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it may be a bit underrated. Well, as far as the production goes, I mean, all I really know is uh, there's a there's a feature on the DVD I have where they talk about the production of the film, and it, and and the feature was apparently made around the time of the film, so it's it's from the early '60s, and. In this, they are stressing the lengths they went to for the cinematography. That's the big deal, getting these shots of submarines. They spent a lot of money doing that, and they, they had to pioneer some, some cinematographic techniques to do it. So that, that was really the main thrust of the documentary. Mm -hmm. So when you say these shots of the submarine are really great, like, yeah, they were. They were really were something special, especially then. Um, so... You know, I, I don't I don't think it's a it's a, I, I don't think it's an accident that what we're seeing is a skate class submarine, which while they were still in commission at the time, they were they were older um, and and uh, not had been um, they'd been replaced by the skipjack class at this point, but they continued to be in service until the 80s when they were decommissioned. Wow. And I wanted to welcome Captain Trek to our audience. Thanks for being here. 
Um, Rick, do you have uh, any uh, Ice Station Zebra uh, trivia to dazzle us with? I don't uh, particularly. Obviously, I think people know that Patrick McGowan's involvement came about um, because he needed to fund the last few episodes of The Prisoner, so he agreed to take on this role on the basis that his fee would help pay for the production of um, Girl Who Was Death and Fallout, because they're basically every man films had run out of money at that point. Um, I didn't and, know that. And obviously it was filmed while Do Not Forsake Me Oh My Darling was being made, hence why that particular episode does not have McGowan in it. Originally they were going to write that episode that number six would um, be vanished by a traveling circus was the original storyline they were going to go with <laughs> and then david tomlin said i think that's even that's even far too weird for the prisoner and um, believe it or not so go yeah. with go with the you know the the whole switcheroo body blokes mind in another person's body thing so vincent tilsley went off and wrote that episode very unhappy with it but he but he wrote it anyway and then that allowed patrick to go off and do ice station zebra which i think slightly overran filming hence why in the girl who was deaf we see Patrick McGowan a lot of the time dressed in this sort of Sherlock Holmes outfit. And that's because his double, Frank Mayer, could do those scenes and appear to still be McGowan because McGowan wasn't back in time to film the start of Girl Who Was Deaf yeah. um, because Ice Station Zebra was slightly overrunning. I think one bit of trivia McGowan related from Ice Station Zebra is that in the scene where they're getting flooded out, the, where, the, where it's been sabotaged, uh, McGowan apparently nearly did um, come a cropper in that scene and he had to be his foot got stuck in part of the uh part of the ladders or whatever for the scene and he nearly drowned and he was rescued by um, a member of the production crew so that's a, wow. a little bit of mcgoohan related trivia for ice station zebra you see i've recently have been involved in publishing a book uh, which has a chapter on ice station zebra and annoyingly i forgot to have it with me for today's show so that might well have had something interesting in it but while you're chatting i'm gonna go on to my computer and find a pdf of it is it uh it's called Guns, Girls, Guns, Gadgets, and Girls. Guns, Girls, and Gadgets. 60 is spy it films available to view here? It is. Um, oh, you might have to scroll down a bit, though. I continue to be amused that McGowan is third build in this film, but he totally outshines everybody else. Well, I think By you made a, a comment. He's got, he's got all the good lines, yeah. and, and his mm -hmm. performance is, is uh, uh, ten times First better rate. than anyone else's. Yeah, I think you made a great point, Ivan, in the in the chat while we were watching the film. That the reason for that is that Rock Hudson was the, was a star, a movie star. Oh, he was, there to was get, a good actor. Yeah, he was there to get the ladies to want to go to the theater. Yeah, that that's what ironically. He was for. Yeah, well, I mean, you didn't talk about those things back then, right? Yeah, the and, studios you know, there were a lot of set up there, and uh, besides today, they're gay stars with a partner. Uh, that was very good looking. So in Rock Hudson's case, it would have been a Barbara Eden type or, you know, that kind the of thing. The girls swoon over uh, Tom Cruise today. What's the difference? Yeah, no difference. Um, I mean, this is, in fact, this movie, in the, in that sense, it kind of reminds me of a, of a Tom Cruise movie, Valkyrie, where mm. it's sort of the sort of the inverse of this. Everybody else in the film was a better actor than he was, and, and noticeably so. <laughs> Okay, uh, Rick, where am I scrolling to? Okay, if you keep scrolling down, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Here we go. I spy. Go back up. Mm -hmm. There we go. Ah. Guns, Girls, and Gadgets, 60s spy films uncovered. Now, I've got it up on my screen now, um, the, uh, the PDF of the book. And I'm going to look for some Ice Station Zebra factoids for you all while you're, uh, while you're chatting about the movie. Uh, if you like, you can share your screen, and I can put it up on the... Uh, I've got it on... I, see, I, I'm a man of many screens, and the screen I have the chat on is not the screen I've got the book up on. I see. So I'm sorry about that. I wouldn't be able to uh, to do that, but uh, I'll, I'll be able to find some factoids for you, I hope. Because okay. there is a nice chapter about the movie in the, uh, uh, in, in the book. Um it's not a film I know a great deal about the production of, other than from the prisoner side of things, you know, but I'm sure there were... But I know that it was that the whole thing was recast. So I think it was originally supposed to be made in about 65. Um, and I think the cast they had originally, obviously things fall apart. And 
I don't think anyone who was the original cast actually ended up um, um, in it. And I'm not sure, because I've never read the book, I'm not sure how much it even follows the original novel. I, suspect... I didn't even know there was a book. Yeah, Alistair MacLean. Um, uh, oh, wrote the that's book. right. Yeah, late 50s, I think. Real Cold War stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, yeah, this is, uh, this is a while, serious Cold War um, plot, yeah. While he's looking for that, uh, Ari, I'd like to get your take on the film. Uh, I know that you've seen it before mm -hmm. and in the theaters. Mm -hmm. Although, I don't know that you would have been old enough to get any nuance if there were any to get. Oh, I but... definitely remember being mostly confused most of the time. Mm hmm um, there was a lot of, uh, as Yvonne mentioned, there was a lot of, uh, it was a big movie at the time. It was, you know, couldn't watch TV for an hour without seeing an ad for it. Um, and like you say, big, big movie stars, Rock Hudson, definitely a movie star, um, Ernest Borgnine, um, definitely a movie star. Uh, my take on the movie is, is that, um, sort of like not quite before intermission and after intermission but you know at first it's sort of a classic submarine movie all of the all of the the usual things uh you're not quite having to be quiet to hide from the nazis but other than that it's pretty much your classic submarine movie straight down the line um and then when we get out onto the ice then it just turns into your straight up spy through thriller you know, there's double and triple crosses and whatnot all over the place. And uh, and then, like we said, it has that kind of no, it may not be an everybody wins ending, but it's certainly a nobody loses ending. Uh, or maybe it's a nobody wins ending is what I should say. And, yeah. and, and so it's very watchable, uh, like Rick said. It's a lot of fun. Good popcorn movie, I think. Um, but no, you know, I don't uh, maybe good cinematography and all that. I don't think it's going to win any awards for storytelling per se. Probably a, probably a better film to watch in the summer, I would say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> so according to IMDb, the film originally cast Gregory Peck, David Niven, Edmund O'Brien, and George Siegel. Yeah, I've got that here as well. Yeah. And um, also according to IMDb, Captain Anders does not appear in the novel. Mm. Yeah, another another name that was originally going to be involved was um, Richard Burton was going to be providing a narration um, um, hmm. to the early part of the film. And yes, you're right. Peck and Siegel were both down to play the um, Rock Hudson role. Yeah. Um, and according and to IMDb, Heston was offered it before and turned it down before they went to Gregory Peck. Uh -huh. hmm. He did do uh submarine picture though uh where he was the captain of the submarine i'm trying i don't remember the title right off who, who did uh charlton heston charlton oh, heston sure. gray lady later. down is that the one you're thinking of i think so yeah yeah yeah, yeah what was it called gray lady down mm -hmm. and it was basically I, I i never saw it but i believe it was basically about a nuclear sub having an accident that causes it to uh causes it to sit on the bottom and they have to rescue the crew. I, I think mm -hmm. that was the, mm -hmm. the, the gist of it. Which happened in, in real life uh, when the, uh, I guess at the time it was Russians, uh, had a sub and the United States offered to help. The Kiev, they are you were, thinking of? They were willing to uh, sacrifice all the men and the submarine so that the Americans couldn't get their hands on it. Yeah. So, yeah, I've got some more casting information if people are interested. So Absolutely. there were four people up for the Rock Hudson part before Rock Hudson. Gregory Peck was the first, as, as Ivan said, David Niven, Edmund O'Brien and George Siegel. And, of course, it went to um, um, Hudson. The um, Boris Vaslov um, uh, character, uh, Edmund O'Brien was the original name linked um, for that. Um I just find uh, I find Borgnine so unbelievable in that role. Yeah, I, you totally could put agree. anybody else in there, and I would have I, I would have an easier. And uh, James Mason was offered the Ooh. Patrick McGowan role, but turned he, it down. Yeah, 
Well, I can see why he would, actually. Yes. Lolita, it's time to get your toenails painted. Come over here. <laughs> well, always be Captain know. Nemo to me. So That would have been a very different take. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. <laughs> no, 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 very few actors um, capture the anger and, and project it on the screen the way McGowan does. I, I you, think as, that's as you because see, when Patrick when, McGowan is actually angry, all is the actually time. angry. When mm -hmm. you see Hudson trying to act angry, you're like, "Ooh, yeah." Uh, he and uh, Ernest Borgnine failed to suspend my disbelief. Mm -hmm. I, I half, I half expect Rock Hudson to say, "I'll give you such a pinch." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, other Arie, than that, did you have okay. anything else to add about uh, uh, your experience watching it uh, in the theater versus watching it uh, just now and maybe any time in between? Um, you know, mostly what I remember from, from watching it in the theater, you know, it was just kind of a Saturday afternoon, um, you know, with my buddy from the neighborhood, just kind of doing what you do or what you did back then, you know. Uh, it, it was it was the big picture, you know. That was kind of in the days when, um, you know, there was one or two theaters in town, and if the movie was very popular, instead of saying the usual two weeks, it would run for weeks on end. And this was one of those, you know, like Airport. Airport in our town ran uh, for over a year. I think it ran sixty weeks or something, which really pretty much unheard of. Yeah, yeah, it was way way Lawrence. above the average. Uh, and um, and I don't know how long this one ran, but it was one of those kinds of movies. You know, stayed in the theater a long time, um, and it was a big deal, a lot of advertising budget. Um, but you know, I like I said, I was depending on whether it came out before my birthday or after my birthday. I was nine or ten right. when it came out, and yeah, I, I remember you know all of the political stuff. I'm just very confused, right? Didn't understand mm -hmm. really all that stuff. I saw the red um, parachutes and it's like, oh, that's got to be the Russians, right? Because that's red. Right. And it turned out to just be the, the cargo <laughs> or the, a, the equipment. Actually the weapons good boxes, yeah. Video yeah. effect. Like uh, some kind of stop motion animation that was really smooth. Well, they used a lot of models in this. I mean, they used a lot of practical effects for for its day. Those were great special effects, frankly. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Even the, even the scenes in the beginning with the satellite. I mean, that was top notch. That actually right reminded me of two thousand and one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the the problem that I had, which I kind of alluded to in the in the chat during the watch party, was uh, you could sort of tell that they were uh, soap flakes. And that oh, they were using foley none. for the oh, yeah. footsteps oh, yeah. on the ice, you oh, know. Yeah. yeah, the ice um, the ice wasn't convincing. No. And but it was but, all done. But in those days that's all done in a sound stage. So, so, yeah. More of the same. Yeah, but that was you know, it was normal. Yeah. Uh, if anything, the they were using the same techniques that had been used for a long time, but they were shooting on nicer film, so you could see how fake it was. And uh, the restoration doesn't make that any better. Mm. Although it's a lovely restoration. Mm. I've only Rick, seen it on uh, DVD else do you quality, have for us? so, you know. I've not been able to find anything else particularly interesting about the production. It does seem as though it was kind of a fairly run-of-the-mill production process. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, the use of miniatures and so on. It's, it's it's rare for something to have been filmed on seventy millimeter. It must have looked mm -hmm. would look great on a big screen. So Ari, it's great that you actually managed to experience that at the time. Um, visually, it must have looked great on the big screen, um, even though you might not have fully understood the nuances of the plot. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it did look great. Oh yeah, yeah, looked looked amazing. Uh, I'm not sure. I still understand the nuances of no, the plot. No, I think I think I, I think I'd, I'd probably join you on that. Yeah, um, I think it does get a bit muddy in, in, in places. Needlessly so, it kind of would be a, a good straightforward thriller. I don't think they needed to to kind of make it as muddy as it as it, as it turned out. But I enjoyed it more than I, I thought I was going to. I did. I, I do remember logging on 
and 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 thinking this is going to be a long couple of hours but it, mm. it actually went by a bit quicker than i than i thought it was going to um and i i must point out because people obviously might not have been there watching with us that that the 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 ice set at the beginning was straight out of that star trek episode mm -hmm. um with mr atos and the uh i can't remember the oh, name the of the jack the, uh, the ripper one the atavacron yeah what was the name of the episode it's uh all, all our yesterdays was it no no um, um uh oh i'm embarrassed now that might be it that's the one with marriott hartley right yeah yeah it's between savage curtain and turnabout intruder but what's it what it's called i don't know uh, come on come on cardinal sin get that I, I, those I think Google it fingers is all our yesterdays i think it all our yesterdays is right uh, the only thing oh, that, well, i apologize if that's right yeah. hold on yeah. I'm just I'm just fuzzy for due to old age. So yeah, yeah, yesterday is tomorrow is the one where they go back and pick up the astronaut, right? Out of his the, uh, F not the astronaut, but the the jet pilot. Yeah, yeah, out of his F one hundred four. Yeah, uh, is that the is that Gary Lockwood? Gary Lockwood's in the in the pilot. Yeah, I think I think he is. Who also plays the the, uh, uh, the the guy that they come back and get, and then they have looks to release like because yeah. his son is important to history. Right, different guy looks a little bit like Lockwood. I think you don't remember his name. No, I don't. Uh, let's see here. Um, so. Uh, Douglas Hayes wrote the screenplay. Harry Julian Frank wrote the screen story. Roger Perry is the guy in Tomorrow Is Yesterday. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't have known him at all. And R, uh, W. R. Burnett is uncredited. He might have been a either an early uh, screenwriter or maybe even a script doctor. Which I think this film desperately needed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of the script is pretty flat and just exposition, really. It's just mm -hmm. here's here's how we get there. But um, again, other than the sabotage sequence, there really isn't much to make a trip by submarine very exciting. And it says it was nominated for two Oscars, uh, best cinematography. Best effects and special visual effects. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that they had those categories uh, in 1968. Well, they had special effects. You know, what about the Ten Commandments? There was special effects all over that. Well, yeah. I mean, it, I just didn't realize that they made, you know, Oscars for that. Oh yeah, because I, I think that um, was a, a more recent thing. Um, Forbidden Planet won a an Oscar for special effects. I uh -huh. think. Yes, of course. Yeah, I mean, we happen to live in a time where special effects took a took a quantum leap. So it's very easy to look back on films older than 1977 and go, yeah. But mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah, I mean. I used to watch, uh, when they showed it on PBS, I used to watch the old Flash Gordon serials. And that's where, you know, they'd show a star field and the stars in the center of the field were brighter than the ones on the edges and where the ships um, had smoke rising off the back of them mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And, and you know, so uh, the special effects in this were, you know, again, for its time, they were great. Mm -hmm. And there's the man himself. Looking quite angry. Yeah. Why don't you put a fucking jacuzzi in this place? <laughs> and all the all the Dutch angles in this film uh, didn't help. Well, I, I mean, they're trying to they're mean, trying to show that the submarine's diving. It's not like when yeah. they use it in a Batman fight. Mm -hmm. Or. You know, on Star Trek, where everybody has to yeah, move yeah. to one side and then move to the other side. Yeah. Uh, welcome. Fish Belly. Saw this at the drive-in. And OJ was a good guy. 
<laughs> yeah. Drive in. Oh, oh. OG was a good guy. He was a good actor. I mean, those... Uh, uh, yeah, but he wasn't in this, so I'm not sure. No. Yeah, that was James Brown, not OJ. Yeah. But about the same uh, time. He was good in uh, Capricorn 1, and yeah. um, uh, those uh, commercials Police where he's story. running through the airport. Yeah, well, you know the difference between Tang and OJ, right? Uh -oh. What's the difference between Tang and OJ? Tang won't kill you. <laughs> yep. I don't know if you remember, Ari, but uh, when I was a kid, there was also Grapefruit and Grape Tang. You know, I don't specifically remember the Grapefruit. I do remember the Grape Tang. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember if I liked it or not. Um, but had Tang's the, ubiquitous. I mean, everybody. Yeah. They had the cartoon commercials with the Moon Men. Yeah. 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 Everybody, everybody had a jar of Tang in their in their cupboard somewhere. That's what the astronauts drink. That's what the astronauts drink. Yeah. yeah. They also kind of wish also, it was still around. Frankly, they also sold us this uh, this this plastic called space food sticks. Oh, I remember basis. those. Yeah. Space, space what? Space, space food, food, food sticks. sticks. Hmm. They were the original energy bar. Wow. They're basically a little cylinder of plastic in a foil bag. Yep. <laughs> if you ever saw. What was that movie? One of the early uh, um, sort of counterculture counterculture anthology comedies. I don't remember the title right now. Uh, Kentucky Fried Movie. Oh, yeah. um, Brown Twenty Nine. That's what the. Uh, well, that was from the Groove Tube. Foods. The Groove yeah. Tube. There you go. The groove yeah. Tube, which has had Richard Belzer in it. Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Space wow. Food Sticks looked like Brown Twenty Nine. They, they did look a lot like Brown Twenty Five. Yeah. Um. But yeah, in the in the late '60s, you could market anything and say the astronauts use this, and people would buy it up. Yep. Oh sure. Ah, damn this mouse. User <laughs> yeah, error. Yeah, that's the one right there. That's the picture right there. Plastered everywhere. Back really? in the day. Oh yeah. Didn't really understand why they were doing smoke grenades, actually, in that scene. But at first, they... I thought it was mustard gas. <laughs> well, they um, the commander does yell out "dim," which is smoke. So ah. he calls for smoke, but I don't know why. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't know why it's so colorful. If we confuse the enemy, perhaps we will win. Yeah, I I, I would have expected just gray smoke, you know, but for some reason. Yeah. We got orange instead. But then nobody dispersed or anything. They shot smoke and everybody stayed where they were. And everybody stood right where they were. Yeah. 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 You know what? It occurred to me that some of the smoke looked like it could have been a visual effect. Mm. Uh, I, I think they were I think they were just smoke canisters. Maybe it, it's just a matter of what smoke canisters the movie production could get their hands on. Because, I mean, nobody coughed or anything. Yeah, but nobody acted like they got blown up either. So. Well, there are certainly some shots where you're looking straight at, say, Patrick McGowan's face or um, Rock Hudson's face, where they've they've superposed uh, a, a camera shot through smoke over top of a yeah. shot of the actor. There's definitely a couple of those. Yeah, I noticed that. Oh, they do still make Tang. Gap Stargate says. Yeah, yeah, Tang still exists. Oh, oh sure. But only in orange. I don't I'm pretty sure you can't get grapefruit tang anymore. Yeah. Hell, I, I have trouble getting right. grapefruit juice at the grocery store, mm -hmm. so. It looks like Patrick McGoon's about to uh pet a puppy. <laughs> yeah. Aren't you a nice dog? Aren't you? So there's there's this one character actor who's in there, when they, the guy they talk to when they get to the station. Um, and uh, it, what? By the way, what was the deal with the guys that were sleeping or near dead or whatever? Yeah, well, they they'd nearly frozen to death, right? Because basically the bad guy burned down the whole burned down the whole station, so nothing mm -hmm. was working. They didn't have any electric power or anything. And they were huddled in the one 
cabin that was still more or less intact. With, um, with the door wide open. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, don't, uh, I interrupted Don't analyze you. this film too much. You'll pull it to pieces. Mm. Yeah. But that the character actor, he, he, um, I don't think it's the same guy, but he reminds me of actor from uh, the original Star Wars film, who is the guy that Darth Vader chokes. Mm. And I, oh, I don't know yeah. what that actor's name is because he's uncredited. Um, but this is actor he? who's in this film was also in another uh, favorite of mine back when Disney made amusing films called uh, called uh, Scandalous John. Mm hmm. He's in um, Rollerball, I think, isn't he? Not sure. I'd have to look it up. The guy that Darth Vader chokes? Yeah. Uh, meaning the, the... Do you mean the guy he chokes at the start or chokes around the briefing table? No, Yeah, around the briefing table. Yeah, yeah. When, when he says... The one who's mocking uh, him, you're Vader, sad. Vader, no yeah. one believes in your old religion. Yeah, your yeah. Sad devotion yeah. to that ancient religion. I'm sure he's one of the... Religion. I'm sure he's one of the suits in Rollerball, but I'd have to see the film again. But I, I think the guy who's in this is the guy who's the Andorian... Not yes. Andorian in um in journey to babel yes that's i knew i recognized him from somewhere that's it yeah oh well done that's a great spot i never spotted that well done well do, i have watched uh, this movie a few times <laughs> do, do people uh say journey to babel as often as they say journey to babel i have no idea anybody i've never heard anyone call it journey of journey to babel i must admit but that's you know could be a across the pond thing. Could be. So there you can d definitely see that these are soap flakes. Oh yeah. That must have been really really harsh wearing those big heavy jackets. Under yeah, the under the, under the lights see, in the studio with all the soap flakes flying around. You couldn't see the uh, the breath on anybody, which yeah yeah. Yeah. Didn't take well, me out of the movie, but all, I definitely noticed it. Stage. Although McGowan's jacket was very stylish. Oh, it was. it was. His parka? Yeah. Yeah. Nice fur trim all around. Oh, I see what you're going for here, Yvonne. It's a, a very narrow conning tower. Yeah. That helps um, it break well, through so, the ice. Um, the skate class, which when you see the whole sub, that's what you're looking at. Um, and of course that's obviously that's on the set. So that's a model. Some of the exteriors were not state class submarines. They were other, other subs. But hmm. when you see the whole, when you see the whole sub, that's a model of a skate class. And those subs were designed for Arctic service. It was a skate class was the first U S sub to surface at the North pole. Hmm. For that purpose. Yeah. They were, they were designed for operating in the Arctic. And as I say, they were superseded by the skipjack class, which had basically this. You had to be able to come up through the ice or you, you wouldn't be able to operate very long. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing about the ice, I mean, is a, a lot of people have misconceptions about the ice pack on the Arctic. All right. Uh, for one, it's it's not a flat sheet. It's nothing like a flat sheet. Mm -hmm. It is an agglomeration of chunks. All right. And it gets pushed around by the wind a lot, so it moves a lot. And there's by nothing the ocean, really, I should think. There's nothing really holding it together, so it'll come apart in places. And that's what kind of when the guy falls into the crevasse. That's normal because it's not a it's not a flat or even sheet of anything. It's just a bunch of chunks that have been pushed together by the wind usually. So uh, am I am I correct in recollecting that uh, Patrick McGowan had a gun in this film? Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he didn't shoot it. No, well, he threatened to. Yeah. Yep. He, he does he, pick up a gun and shoot it. I don't think his. I don't know whether it's his own or not. He shoots uh, James Brown towards when the he, end. Yeah, when he shoots shoots oh. James Brown, I don't know whether that's with his own pistol or somebody else's. Yeah. Well, that's another reason why he's probably not number six or John Drake because he's he seems quite happy to to go around killing people, whereas. Well, uh, I mean, Drake shot at somebody once in self-defense, I think, and that's the only yeah. time in '86 episode you ever saw John Drake pull a gun. He said it, he said it's his job to murder, and he does it yeah. with great pride. So yeah, you know, it's not John Drake. Even though, as I say, John Drake's, I believe, the first episode his mission is to go assassinate an assassin. 
Mm. So right. it's, it's not that he won't kill. But, but he, he has doubts kill. about... He won't but kill he him necessarily. Yeah. He has yeah. doubts about assassinating the assassin. He doesn't want to do it. It's yeah, he doesn't want to do it. Opposed. Right. Yeah. He certainly doesn't and, take And by right. the way, it's Darren Nesbitt. So just... It is, yeah. 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 Time to Kill is the episode. It's a uh, great episode filmed on location in North Wales. Mm. And Greg 2600 is right. It's Jim Brown, not James Brown. James Brown is the godfather of soul. That's right. Ow! I feel good. Jim Brown, is it is the Dirty Dozen after this or before this? Uh, right around the same time, I think. I want to say it's before, but I think I think it is because I think the Dirty Dozen was the first film Brown did. Um. So this is so we've basically seen the alpha and omega of his illustrious film career. <laughs> if you've seen uh, if you've seen the Dirty Dozen in this. Yeah, Dirty Dozen is definitely before this because the prisoner actually reused some sets from the Dirty Dozen. So uh -huh. we know that the prisoner was nearly ended by the time this film was made. Yeah. So Dirty Dozen was fil yeah, filmed in 66, released in 67. I, I was amused. Release date, release date was my birthday, 1967. Ah. When was? 21st of September 1967 was the release date of Dirty Dozen. I wasn't born in 1967, but 21st of September was my birthday. Oh, I see. Anybody that. wants to get me a card when it comes to September? <laughs> Greetings, Herc 130. And Greg 2600. And just another red shirt. I think we already said hi to Brian Hepburn, but... Yeah. Orange Julius. <laughs> yeah. Apparently and Michael Beacom is here. Hail Michael Beacom. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Should we invite Michael Beacom on to the panel? Absolutely. Sure. Let me... Uh, what he has to say. If he has anything to say about this film, I'm very interested. Send him a link. And one of the things that always kind of, you know, there's there's a number of things in this film where I go, yeah, and I'm not sure about that. And one of them is, okay, so this character that they, they made for Jim Brown, uh, Captain Anders, you don't, you don't meet a lot of African Americans with a Scandinavian last name. It's <laughs> much more common for them to have a Welsh last name. Hmm. I don't know much about Rock Hudson's career. Uh, this film was kind of, it was, it was tr trying to save his career at this point. So I think yeah, it does. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how did yeah. it turn out? Did, did this save his career or was it all further down here? I, I think it was downhill from here, but let's yeah. see what IMDb says. Yeah. While you're looking that up, I, I do remember there was a made for TV movie or a, a, a very small mini series where he played a commander in an Arctic setting that, and this was like at the very height of the cold war tensions. It was after uh, this movie, this was in the early to mid seventies. And it was, uh, you know, the Russians were invading on the Alaskan frontier or something crazy like that. Oh, and he was a commander was, of that unit. There was a mini series in the early eighties uh, called, I think it was called world war three and, and rock Hudson was the president, I believe. Mm. Now this one, he was a commander in the field, but it's a similar, yeah, similar setup. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, at, at that point, it was like, oh, Rock Hudson, he's still around. Okay, don't know exactly when that was. Don't know the. Yeah, so he went to TV after this. So yes, his movie career didn't exactly because uh, except, except he was for he was McMillan and McMillan and wife for except for mm. Cry Wilderness. Six seasons in Cry Wilderness, which was a uh, might have been a made for TV movie, um, but uh, uh, MST3K riffed it, uh, I think last season. Or and he was he that. was the main character in the miniseries Wheels. I've never heard of that. Oh, yeah, it was based on a book by what's his face. I still, I actually watched it when I lived in Sweden. It was on TV then. Hmm. 
um, Bielstaden uh, was the title. Uh, who's that? Is it Michener who wrote Wheels? Yeah, he wrote Wheels. No, no, it was the same guy who wrote Hotel. Um, what's that author's name? Boy, you got me. Yeah, it was, it was the same guy who wrote, wrote Hotel. And it was the basically fictionalized story of the development of the Mustang. Mm. The car? Yeah. Hmm. In the, in the, lock, but it's, it's the, the first, the first pony car. Basically. Oh, Ari, is this the, uh, the stylish outfit you mentioned? No, no, I would meant the parka when, when okay. you said you you mean the parka. Yeah. Uh, this is, of course, quite stylish. Uh, He's looking quite dapper, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gap Stargate reminds me that uh, Rock Hudson was also in the Martian Chronicles miniseries. That's right, he was. Yeah, but yeah, it looks like, with a couple of exceptions after this, all he does is television. Mm -hmm. Avalanche, that's what I was thinking of, not Cry Wilderness. That's a different movie. Arthur Haley is the, yeah, that's right. Arthur Haley is correct. That's the author of both Hotel and Wheels. Boy, there's a couple of mugs. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of uh, promotional stills for this. I think you could have picked up almost any inexpensive British extra and had them do a better Russian accent. <laughs> there's a few dodgy accents right at the start when Rock Hudson's in that pub, which is supposedly supposed to be in Scotland. The, the bar manager or whatever is, is yeah. quite obviously not Scottish, or if he is, he's putting on the most hilarious right picture right. of his own accent oh hello there yes i yes. go get him for you, you know. <laughs> mccloskey's bar yeah <laughs> well, they a, probably picked up some irish guy from bar. boston they probably yeah. picked up some irish guy from boston and said yeah be a scotsman for this you know yeah yeah you're probably right there and welcome to the panel michael beacom hey michael beacom the legend the man himself. Hey, Michael. He may be experiencing technical issues. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but it's great to see him. Maybe even yeah. better to hear him. Maybe he only speaks through chat, which is how we've known him for the last 19 weeks. You know, if yeah. you've never bothered to set your microphone up to do this, uh, mm -hmm. there can be some hurdles. Yep. Uh, speaking of Disney movies that uh, were, uh, you know, back when they were good, um, although the connection to this movie is is very tenuous, uh, when when I saw Darby O'Gill and the Little People, the Banshee scared the fuck out of me when I was a little kid. And, yeah, of I course, was, Sean Connery sings. I was easily scared mm -hmm. when I was young. There, there are lots of things that were just too scary for me to watch. Oh, Russian aid. Huh. A quick uh, quiz question for you all. I'm sure you can all name McGowan's three Disney movies. Three well, I know Disney two, movies? I know two of them. Uh... But I don't know what I don't know the third one. Uh, go ahead. Go for it, Ivan. Well, Doctor Sin, obviously, yeah. that was the first thing I ever saw him going in. Uh -huh. And in the U.S., it was called the the Scarecrow of Romney Marsh. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Um, and then the Three Lives of Thomasina. Correct. The third, one, the third did, one. The third one was Baby Secret of the Lost Legend. Oh, that's right. That was a movie. Mm -hmm. I purposely didn't go awful see. film. Yeah, that's a, that's one I purposely didn't go see. So. Yeah, yeah. He only, he I've, only never, made I've literally never seen it. 
he had a three he had a three picture deal with Disney, which he signed in 1963, and it took him 21 years to make the third one. That's so right. Chose that. I forgot about <laughs> that. Yeah. There's a number of films like that, and even TV series where when they were advertised, I went, "Oh, give me a fucking break!" <laughs> yeah, and refused to ever watch them. Yeah, and that includes things people like. I, I mean, let's be let's be clear. I just some stuff just turns me off. Yeah, there they've got Rock Hudson right in the front. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's the star. Mm -hmm. Air quotes. Yeah. But again, as, as somebody somebody in the chat while we were watching the movie caught my reference, he's not an actor, he's a movie star, which is right. basically comes from my favorite year. <laughs> if I, mean, I love reference. that movie. That I is, love that my favorite year. It is a hilarious film. It's a great movie. Fictionalization Fresh. of the real life experience of Mel Brooks when he was given the job of uh, taking care of... Um, Errol Flynn while he was in town oh, no. to be on, I believe, Sid Caesar's show of shows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to sure. take care of him in what way? Well, he was a notorious drunk. Yeah. And you had somebody had to make sure he was going to be there for shooting. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah. Just, I mean, basically, Alan Swan is Errol Flynn in, in mm -hmm. just about every way. I mean, again, it's, it's a fictionalized account, but it's, it's the real life experiences of Mel Brooks that went into this. Interesting. I should add for the completists out there who are going to jump on me at some point, if you include voiceovers, McGowan actually did four Disney films because he provided the voice for Billy Bones in 2002's Treasure Planet. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't including I voiceovers. See. I didn't think that would count. Is that a good movie? I've never seen it. It's a kid's animated Disney film from the 2000s, so mm -hmm. probably great fun if you're 12. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite in the target demographic for that, are we? No. <laughs> no. Not anymore. And to Greg's comment, yeah, there were no there are no women in this film. We were talking about that. We were watching it and trying to name other films that didn't have any women in them, and I came up with two. And I yeah, can't you did very well. You did very I can't well. think of another one. Yeah. Yvonne knows almost everything about almost everything. Did the two, really the two true, you came up with that. were both submarine movies? Is that is that what I remember? Um, no, well, well, the thing isn't a, the uh, the eighty one, eighty one, or eighty two, whenever that came out. Thing yeah. isn't a submarine movie, but the other one is. It's the Enemy Below, which is actually a, a wonderful film. I, I like Good it a film, lot. Yeah. With uh, Robert Mitchum as a destroyer skipper. And Kurt Jurgens is the U-boat captain. Oh, yeah. Great film. Uh, Gap Stargate says, I have the old original movie lobby cards of Ice Station Zebra. Yeah, oh, here cards. we go. I, I, I knew somebody who collected those. Yeah, I, I used to have about a dozen. I, I sold mm. them about two years ago to a, to a collector who offered me stupid money for them. Mm. Uh, yeah, you might be right about Escape from Alcatraz. It works. I, I that one. There's hey, Michael. Hey, hey Michael. Greetings. The legend. Greetings. Good to see you down there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was babysitting uh, the grandbaby earlier, so I missed the earlier part. Sorry, I just got here. But you're talking about Treasure Planet. Uh, it's actually better than, if you look at it, it's it's better than you'd expect from the name. It, it's a, it's a silly-sounding premise, but it was actually a... Yeah. Oh. Nice to know. I've got it. I, I just haven't watched it. Like a lot of... There's a few Magoon films I've, I've owned and never watched. Because they just look as though I'm yeah, not going to enjoy right. them. Because he did make some stinkers. Yeah, I might, I might be talked into watching that one, but I will not be talked into watching Baby. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're not missing much there. Oh, another uh, Patrick yeah, McGuinn film. Michael, it's really good to have you on the panel after. Well, thank you, thank you for the 19 invite. Nineteen shows where you've been uh, very knowledgeable and. Uh, uh, it's yeah, I hear you talking about women or uh, uh, movies with no women. I'm getting a weird thing. I'm hearing the chat like repeating in the background. Should I be hearing that or hearing the chat no, that means in the it's background? Lupus. Well, the chat. Yeah. I'm hearing a conversation. So you're talking to me here, but I'm hearing also talking uh, like a delayed or repeat. Oh, is your, is you your might YouTube have your still YouTube running? still on. You can oh, mute your uh, YouTube yes. window. Yes, gotcha. Um, of then course. Because you hear it with a delay. That's, that's that's like the newbie. You know, ah, sorry. Yeah, I've never done you. Never, uh, yeah, lose you zoom a lot, never use stream yards. Yeah, does Sorry, Reservoir yeah. Dogs have any women in the cast? Oh, uh, to add to the list, 
I can't think of any. Not as a main character, no. No. I think there's some, they're intera- like interacting because at Reservoir Dogs, there's uh, a couple of scenes like in restaurants and things, aren't there? Well, yeah. yeah. I, I, I would say they're in the diner a lot. Yeah. I mean, I've been in a lot of films extra, that don't have a female, a female main female. character, but have women in them. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah and I wasn't sure if women, are, but yeah, you're well done for picking out the restaurant scenes. Yeah. So that, that, that crosses yeah. that one. But, but not, well, but yeah. Uh, yeah. And you mentioned the thing, of course, right? Yeah. yeah the original thing. one. Yeah. Because the original. Not the original one. I mean, not the original. Because the original yeah, has does. women in it. Yeah. 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 That's when I knew that the uh, the prequel they were doing. The minute they mentioned like the main characters of girls, like scratch, stop, forget it. <laughs> oh, right oh, there. There's another. There's another film with no women in it. One of my favorites, Stalag Seventeen. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, there wouldn't be. Oh. No, no, wait. I take that back. There are women in Stalag Seventeen. That, that's not correct. There is a Russian women's camp right next to the camp. Yep. Yep. Mm. Yep. In Stalag Seventeen. Never mind. Do we do we see them? I think we do see them in one scene where the where the mm-hmm. dumb guy is painting, um, oh, yeah. and he's distracted by the by the Russian women. And at the end of the movie, of course, uh, William Holden says to him, "Get two thousand cigarettes to bribe the guards, and also get a new face." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is some play of Stalag Seventeen. Uh, it's all guys. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and the other one, I think I'd have to look up. I'm not sure, but I don't think there are any women in Twelve O'clock High. Okay. Well, I feel my oh no, isn't there a nurse? Twelve O'clock, you being the Gregory Peck? Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, isn't there a nurse he talked to or something? One second. Oh, um, maybe. I'll have to look that one up though. But uh, yeah. yeah, if there's if there's a woman in that, it's a bit part. It's war films are your best are your best bet for yeah, them, think, yeah right definitely war films. I mean, that's the, the Great Escape one. doesn't doesn't have any until they escape and you right. see some people that on a platform women. and that's about it. And there are actually some there are actually some very famous women in uh, the Longest Day. So, oh yeah, Sean Phillips has a uh, has has a very small part in that film. Yeah, looking it up. Taking care of some administrative duties here. Gotcha. Um, Michael, uh, how long has it been since you saw I Station Zebra? Oh, I watch it frequently. It's like about two weeks ago or less. I have the Blu-ray. I love the uh, uh, the widescreen. We were going to try to get that back at one of my friend uh, Bruce Crawford's movie events. We did these terrific events where we'd screen these classic films, but we never managed uh, came this close to getting uh, Guns of Navarone, but uh, uh, that, that fell through. But no, the Ice Station Zebra, we didn't, because we'd love a Cinerama, big Cinerama print. That, that That's one of those movies where you got to watch it as big as you can. Although uh, it is so painful uh, when I watch the Arctic scenes. <laughs> but the, yeah. These the, poor guys. The yeah. Ice coming out. Oh, oh, God, yeah. Poor bastards in these coats with uh, uh, obviously under the lights. But uh, for people who don't aren't aware of what it takes to make a movie, the the cost and problems of bringing that Cinerama gear on uh, out, you know, on location at that time would have been prohibitive. They could they just couldn't do it. The camera's 800 pounds. They can't uh, go slugging this thing around out to the tundra. So they, they really didn't have much choice. Um, so I cut it a lot of slack for that. It wasn't like they, they decided, well, let's get cardboard backgrounds. It's just that's yeah, what, I, all you could do. As I say, I don't think it was worse effects than were normal at the time. The no, difference no. difference is it was better cameras. And so it really does oh, yeah. make the styrofoam look like styrofoam. Hey. <laughs> yes. like soap well, and, yeah. and like I said before, uh, you know, nobody expected it to be remastered in 4K. <laughs> so, oh, no, yeah, these, it was unimaginable to them at the um, time. Sure. Yeah. yeah, if you go to my friend's website, website omahafilmevent.com, we've been bringing classic movies back to Omaha uh, for charity events since like 1993, and we get like, to uh, uh, in I've, the theater. You mean? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Cool. I've been so uh, yeah. Actually, we got we're we're going to be doing uh, ET coming up in May, uh, but uh, uh, and we bring back the filmmakers or the uh, actors, and uh, so you get to talk to them about about uh, a lot about the the technical process it's pretty cool but uh, but that's one of the things yeah you find out things like that that uh uh 
you know, they just couldn't have, they could have done that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, nobody, they'd be horrified. I mean, some of these people would be absolutely horrified if they knew that we have a mini editing bay. I mean, back when the, <laughs> these shows were made, um, if a mistake happened, it flew by so quickly, they could likely get away with it. So uh, there's a whole book of things called film flubs, and you realize, uh, I mean, by the time they catch some of the flubs, the expense of reshooting and going back and retooling things, and they do it, and people just don't notice it. Um, and if you think that, oh, they always catch everything, I saw Star Wars 20 times before I saw the first one, before I saw the stormtrooper whack his head at going through the door into the scene. Yeah, he knows that, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I watched that all year. We went to like every month and uh, saw it, and I never noticed it. So, uh, so they're not entirely wrong. But and that was the, definitely played for laughs, right? It was on. It was unintentional. But the thing is, by the time it was discovered. Uh, the sets are struck. They, they've moved on. There may be a different studio or elsewhere. Uh, the expense of redoing it uh, was is impo- yeah, was totally prohibitive. And there's no digital cleanup possible like they could do today. Um, some filmmakers, uh, people we talk to, like uh, classics, classic uh, performers, really kind of look down their nose at the, the modern digital age because these guys know it can be sloppy as hell and go back and quote fix it and post well, and besides every army has one klutz so oh well yeah I mean, and, just not... oh yeah but but i mean the, the the very thought if you would have gone back and told them and I, it, when they were editing uh i station zebra hey you know in the future we're going to have this thing where we can we can put your movie on we just like on your editing bay we can freeze frame it we can go through frame by frame we can you know, blow it up we can uh, all these things, they would be uh, horrified, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, sure. lay, they're, all their tricks laid bare. And uh, You know, Michael brings up something yeah. that, uh, Gil, you asked me earlier about uh, the experience in, in 68 when it came out. Mm-hmm. And I had forgotten. Um, mm-hmm. Rick mentioned that it was shot in 70 millimeter. Uh, that was one of the huge selling points of yeah. the film of the time is the, the big cinemascope 70 millimeter um, that was one of the things that pushed a lot of people into the theater, I think, is, is that whole, you know, come experience this the relatively new oh, yeah. uh, thing on the huge screen. And, and uh, I think they even started doing the, the kind of the wraparound screen back then. So, oh, yeah. That well, that, yeah, cool. exactly. That was uh, that was yeah. the whole idea. The Cinerama Dome. Yes. Yeah. Oh, hey, we had in Omaha uh, until they knocked it down to make a parking lot, which was criminal. We had this, uh, a uh, Cooper 70 theater called the Indian Hills. It's what they call the hat box style. It's bigger. It was bigger than the Cinerama dome. It's a hundred foot screen, 45 feet high. Chlor- I mean, yeah, we, uh, we had uh, the re premiere of Ben Hur there again on the wow. 70 millimeter print. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, and how, how do you get these prints? Uh, my buddy Bruce uh, uh, can network like nobody's business, and he just started. He, when he was fifteen, he wrote letters to a couple of his people that made movies that he liked. One guy was a, a little f- a special effects dude called Ray Harryhausen, yeah. and and the other one was this guy who liked to compose film sc- scores called Bernard Herman, and he just started making friends with them. And those two names have opened tons of doors. So when, when uh, Ray got, if you look up OmahaFilmEvent.com, um, yeah, and it, it was so funny because I was there. I was always kind of his uh, right-hand guy. Harryhausen, Bruce would be asking Harryhausen every year, hey, you know, when you're coming to the States, why don't you stop by in the Midwest here and do a film thing? And Ray would always say, no, no. Then finally he got the honorary Oscar. So the year after that he was coming through. He had like a week layover, so he said, "What do what do you want to do?" And we were both kind of terrified because, like, yeah, what do we want to do? And so we, uh, and that's we had this theater in town, so we just he booked the theater. Uh, I was called I don't know if they call four walling, but basically we we rented out the theater, and they get special rates if it's a, a charity event. So we got a local charity, and the, so the proceeds go to them. It was a not for profit thing. We didn't care about making money. We just wanted to cover the bills. Ray came in for a, a give a talk at the university, and we had a pristine. Was a, we had a used print of Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, but it was seventy millimeter, and we had a brand new from the lab copy of uh, Jason and the Argonauts, which wow. oh, 
yeah, we, we panicked because when it showed up, the canister said uh, Jason the Golden Fleece. Mm -hmm. We thought, oh Christ, they sent us the wrong movie. No, that's that's the British. <laughs> That was the British uh, name for it. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I'd been watching that movie since I'd been six years old. But when you see this on a hundred foot screen with oh, full sound, uh, like Talos, the scene, they got, you know, the scene I mean with the yeah. 300 foot, yeah. terrifying. I mean, uh, there are people in this, I mean, this is a sophisticated, it's 1993. These guys have seen stuff. This is the year Jurassic Park. And yet still people are going, oh my God, as they see this happening. But, uh, so yeah, the, the uh, this theater is the one that pr proved to me the theater experience. People say the theaters don't make a difference, and the heck they don't. We had uh, Janet Lee come for Psycho. Wow. She was writing a book about it, and she had never. Her daughter Kelly Curtis had never seen the whole film. I couldn't. I still. I still don't believe that. It's like, are you are you serious? But uh, Kelly was a very impressionable child, and they didn't want to see mommy killed on screen, right? So. They uh, so we had it uh, at at the theater, and now I thought I knew Psycho. I had it on VHS. I had it on a little CD uh, capacitance electronic disc that they had. I had Richard J. N. Noble had cut a print up and made a book, like a little picture book, so you could look flip through, uh, pay literally scene by scene. So I thought I knew the movie, and yet when you're in the dark, you're there. It's 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 surrounding you um you jumped the shower scene came and we all jumped you know it's coming i mean you've seen you people have never seen that movie have seen a hundred cl that clip a hundred times and you still jump that's the power of theater yeah yeah definitely uh, and a good score oh yeah oh well yeah that was uh <laughs> yeah that was wild um, the theater experience blows away any home <laughs> entertainment system oh yeah yeah, you yeah, know, it did. Well, certainly back when you had a large screen and film. I'm not not sold on the theater experience today. Depends on the theater, but you're right. Yeah, you're some of them the uh, yeah. We just went to go see Uncharted last night. And there was a Dolby Atmos theater and so uh the film was ridiculous, but it was really yeah, you know, it was a really good surround ridiculous. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there was when one you say remaining. It was ridiculous. Uh, do you mean it was it was bad? Um, you know, it's, some people are calling it bad, but here's the deal. Did you like the Did you like the uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean movies? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Same. Yeah. It, it's just it's just like that. It's a it's you, you, without giving it away. You see it in the credits. The very first scene, you Tom Holland. You first see him, and he's on these these packing crates, trailing behind a uh, a. Uh, Carrier, you know, uh, air uh, freight ship, B one thirty seven or something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, and you see him leap forward from. So the got the, the crates. He's leaping forward from one to the other. And the minute I saw him do that, I thought, oh, okay, yeah, there we go. So you know, check check the brain and just sit back and watch stuff explode. Yeah, don't worry about the physics. Yeah, yeah, the phys They just they just threw Isaac Newton out of the building. So <laughs> just just, uh, <laughs> just sit back and enjoy it. And if you do that, that's good. It's a good ride. Like Legolas, like Legolas on the Oliphant. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, again. It's some people say. Well, I think the the Tolkien would have liked these movies. I said not that part. <laughs> but yeah, definitely not that part. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no. But the uh, but the, back to the theater. Yeah, that I uh, if you check it out, it's, it's OmahaFilmEvent.com. dot You can see the events we've done, and uh, got to spend some uh, quality time with the with these people. Um, but yeah, we've got COVID kind of put uh, uh, the brakes on things. We've been we're doing two a year, uh, and Bruce wants to get up to like fifty before we before we stop. It's just become an annual thing. But but uh, that's the cool thing is you get to spend uh, a lot of time taking these uh, you know celebrities or uh, out to lunch and stuff. Uh, of course, Herman passed away in seventy five. We never got to Bruce produced a special. If you want to hear it. Uh, National Public Radio. There's a uh, Bernard Herman, his life and music, and uh, I helped him do the editing for it. We talk. I talked to a lot of people uh, who also aren't around anymore, but uh, uh, about the film music, and so it's like about a three and a half hour special. He wanted to do it for radio because when you do it for TV, you you can't afford clips. I mean, clips are like you got like a couple of seconds worth of clips, and he wanted to play the entire 
piece from beginning to end. So yeah, we, uh, a, we a did couple that. of minutes is like sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. So we we were it's just a small, uh, you know, uh, NPR station, Republic station. So yeah. that was beyond the budget, but we got it done. So when you get uh, celebrities like Janet Lee yeah. and people yeah. like that, uh, how how does the group or the charity or whatever pay for their you know uh, oh, expenses uh, oh well i write a check uh, they bruce bruce uh, calls up their agent and they uh you know f- fax or uh, used to be fax these days digitally send over a contract and they, they talk i mean it takes a long time we could do two of these a year but he's working on it constantly so there's a lot of conversation back and forth um finally you, you agree to a price um you you know, they send a contract, we sign it, he sends it back, they sign it, and then uh, we, we book plane tickets and stuff. We've got some nice philanthropists. Uh, we've got, like, you know, Warren Buffett lives in town, for example, and we got uh, a lot in of his Omaha? friends. Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. I did not know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's uh, he, he still... Well, that's, uh, that's only four hours from where I live, so... Ah. Uh, um, next time you have one, please let me know. I will send you the details when we get it. We're, we haven't got it locked down yet, but when we get the next one, uh, we went to a convention in Kansas City to talk to D. Wallace about uh, coming back for uh, 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 coming back for ET. I mean, that's the thing is we can't you can't always afford like everybody, uh, mm-hmm. but, and also uh, some people just it's just not in the schedule or. Uh, whatever, but the people that agree to come out to the Midwest for a for a, a film event are uh, uh, pretty special. I mean, so usually we have a great time with them because they want to be here. Uh, I tell you, one of the one of the coolest guys ever. If you ever can see him at a convention, or if we were trying to work him back here, Michael Bean. We did Aliens, and Bean uh. was loving it. Um, Bean, now by then our 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 big theater, the Cinerama Theater, was gone. Uh, mm-hmm. dang it but uh, we had this uh, there's a local uh, uh, it's a museum actually and they've got a, a theater in the middle of the museum and it's convertible it has a screen you can put a projector in but uh, we so we're watching aliens but here's the thing he's seen the movie so he's out in the lobby signing autographs and he's taking his time with each and every fan the, the autograph line was taking forever mm-hmm. we had about like what 600 people uh, all waiting, and I had to go back to the line and say, "Look, um, here's the thing. Do you want us to ask Mr. Bean to speed up? He's take, he's giving everybody their their shot and their time, and uh, etc." And they went, "No, no, 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 no." And so they were all content to wait for like two hours or however long it took. But that was the thing is that from the first fan to the last fan, he treated everybody like they were important. Didn't mm-hmm. make anyone feel rushed, like they were imposing, posed for pictures, did things. Um, you know, so, I mean, of course, again, he's getting he's getting paid for it as well. But he uh, uh, he was thrilled. He he keeps a picture of it because his kids. That's one thing you find out. Like his kids aren't uh, uh, weren't. You know, dad's not a big thing to them. He's just dad, right? And so he tries yeah. to say, "Well, I'm a big thing some places." So he took. We've got this shot. Uh, actually, it's on the it's on the web page. So he he took his phone and did a selfie, and so he got the theater. It's. Uh, it's like 1,100 people capacity, but realistically, you can only put about like eight, nine hundred in to watch a movie because the other, it's for concerts, so the seats are up on the side. You can listen but not see. But uh, but he took a picture of that and <laughs> showed that to his kids. It's like there's all these people; they're just here to see him. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, but yeah, no, we've had a, a, a. I love movies, and we've had a great time with these with these events but that things like uh that was what was happening with uh uh that's why they were expanding this technology is because in the 50s television they were terrified like they are again that television or now you know digital was going to uh you know make theaters obsolete yeah they had uh, to come up with these they had to come up with new ways of, of astonishing the audience yeah oh absolutely. yeah well, Absolutely, absolutely right, Michael. Now, on that bombshell, I'm afraid yeah. as it's uh, as it's uh, half midnight here. Good grief! I'm um, I'm going to have to love you and leave you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much. Um, well, I just want to say thank you to Cardinal Sin for the last 19 weeks. Oh, well, this has been fantastic! Yeah, to get together and and chat to each other, and 
I've made some friends. You're Michael Beacom, you're a legend. Oh, it's so lovely to oh, have you here these last few weeks. Ivan, you're just a wealth of information. And, and Cardinal, oh, yes. you, are, you know, you're, you're a genius for getting us all together in this way. <laughs> I've really enjoyed it. I don't know about it. that, but uh, no, you are <laughs> very pleased that you've been able to enhance uh, the show and, and oh, make yes. it uh, even more something that we can think about. <laughs> It's been a total thrill every week uh, listening to everybody. But yeah, Rick, you've really been a huge contributor, oh, and uh, well, you're very it's been good. terrific. Yeah, we wouldn't the, have been the checks in the post. Yeah, <laughs> really really brilliant. 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 I should, no, it should be the so other way around. I can able to destroy. So that's <laughs> very oh, helpful. Yes. Well, Cardinal Sin, all I would request is, can you get us all together again in a few weeks' time, maybe to chat about just the prisoner or danger man or something as a whole? Get us all together for one last uh, one last chat. It'd be great. Let me know when. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll see what I can do. Fantastic. But in the meantime, thanks, gents. It's been such a, a pleasure this evening. And Michael, I could listen to your stories all night. So let's have a Michael Beacom special. In a no, <laughs> and we can no. <laughs> we can no. get some more get some more stuff out of you. Thanks, Maybe everybody. He and can um, give away yeah. some free tickets to the next uh, big event. <laughs> up there. Um, yeah. They uh, well, we'll uh, again. That should be in May, and I uh, will definitely let you know. Let me. Let me get, if you want to see what we've done so far, um, that's the uh, OmahaFilmEvent.com. If you check into that, um, it's it's kind of ironic. I'm not in a lot of the pictures because I'm taking most of them, or at least for the first few years. But uh, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a commute for me, but if I was there, I'd love to, uh, <laughs> oh, I'd love to come. Oh, yeah. yeah. One that day, was... one day. When, when, when that lottery win comes in, I'm right with you, Michael. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, just just to wrap up our other topic, mm. yeah, 12 yeah. o'clock high does have a woman in it. There is one nurse character. Oh, well I done. knew it. I remembered I it. Cause it. Cause, yeah. Likewise, yeah. The, the gallant the gallant hours has one nurse character in it. So also does not meet our does not meet our standard. Mm. And Greg 2600 says Rick has been terrific. Wow, yes. you must have been listening to a different Rick, but thanks ever so much. <laughs> That's very kind of you to say so. I've enjoyed it. How can you not enjoy getting the chance to talk about the prisoner and danger man with, with some new pals every week? It's been a, it's been a genuine joy and lovely to, oh, to, yeah. uh, say, to, to make some new friends. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you all soon. And thank, thanks for tonight. Absolutely. Thanks for being well, here. So, take all care. the best. Be seeing you. Be seeing you. Be seeing you. Very cool. Well, thank you for that. That was a great to talk to Rick. Yeah, yeah. It's great to have you on, uh, like I said, after <laughs> all these weeks of uh, knowledgeable, uh, you know, uh, factoids uh, coming from you in the chat. Uh, it's oh, uh, nice. it's a, an honor having you on the panel. Oh, you know, I could, well, about the chat, I just hope I don't uh, do typo. I've been uh, struggling with, got a very nice uh, keyboard from a friend here mm -hmm. it's a sort of a steampunk style like a typewriter keys but mm -hmm. it's starting to malfunction and i don't have the heart to to swap it out so i'm just trying to, to force it to work so, so if you see me uh if you if i type something and there's like extra w's or something i can't help mm -hmm. it <laughs> well you uh, could always what? sneak a, a usb keyboard in there and we won't tell anyone oh yeah well they got, yeah that's cool but, my typos uh, in chat are pretty are pretty legion so <laughs> yeah oh true um oh just got I'm, I'm yeah i wasn't really expecting to be on a, a camera tonight the webcam i get the uh, the cable had popped loose was my problem but now i'm looking at my room in the background oh geez <laughs> oh that's great that, yeah that's a there's a few of my these are two of my video bookcases or a third one there there's about oh one two about uh five others on the other side of this that my this is uh i've got the bookcases set up here i've got my tv on the other side of it mm -hmm. sort of bisecting the room but uh yeah but yeah every friday we have a, a group to get together and watch stuff but uh i was going to ask you michael hmm. um how much does it cost to get the movies, you know, sent to the theater? Oh, that uh, back, you know. Bruce doesn't always share the details with me. Um, I tell you what, I can give. Oh, uh, uh, give me a an email address, and I'll put you in touch with my because I don't do the 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 contract part of it. Is all Mr. Bruce Crawford. I'm just I'm his 
coordinator. Once he gets it set up, I'm the guy who makes sure everything goes well that evening. The, the autograph lines and everybody's got stuff like gotcha. that. So that's it. But he's the one who uh, does it. And but usually it's uh, oh, I mean you got to but you 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 pay for the uh, theater, and then you got you do have to rent the print. Uh, again, he's got connections, so I think he gets deals other people might not, um, and because that's totally the way that's the way all Hollywood works. Sure. Um, but uh, uh, friends of friends and and uh, that sort of thing. But uh, but yeah, there's a set price, and there's some things we haven't been able to do. Uh, we want to do something with like Raquel Welch, because again, Bruce being a, a Harryhausen uh, fan. He uh, wants. We want to do like one million years BC, but uh, Raquel's price is just too much. We can't even even with generous donors, we can't make it work for the charity. Because I mean, at the end, uh, we do um, we do want to make some money for we got like the Nebraska Kidney Foundation or others, and uh, uh, we do want that to come out well, and that it usually does. Um, we had Jane Seymour here. Oh, she was fantastic, um, and wow. she yeah she sold like about. She brought a bunch of merchandise with her, and she sold like, no, I probably shouldn't say out loud, so I won't be listening, but uh, many thousands uh, of dollars went to the uh, to the charity through her efforts. She had an actual painting she'd done uh, of uh, her and Christopher Reeve from somewhere in time. Mm-hmm. That was the movie we were showing. Uh, but yeah, that Great was, film. oh yeah. And she, uh, well, the, again, the cool thing is if these people agree to come out here, I mean, imagine the ones that uh, if someone turns him down or has a problem, he never let he never tells us. He only tells us when they when they say yes, uh, and he keeps his secrets that. So if it was anybody who was particularly difficult, he won't share it. But uh, but the people who come are just the best. Gene Seymour was was I mean, it's like you kind of hope these people will be fabulous and wonderful and have a great time, and then they are, and it's just you know, just the best. Awesome. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a. Uh, and uh, and the, I mean these people appreciate their fans. Um, there's only one guest I can think of when it, when it comes like around Academy Award time. I stopped watching the Academy Awards a while ago. Yeah, and, me too. Yeah. Well, this guy was the president of the Academy for two years running, and I won't name a name, but uh, uh, Steven Spiel. Was it Bryce Zabel? Maybe, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, the. Uh, uh, yeah, well, let's just say Steven Spielberg redid the film this year. An actor from from one of that, and I'm asking him. This is before they did ten movies. I only did five, and I'm saying, okay, well, how do you decide who's the best movie and stuff? I mean, they send you, uh, and he goes, oh, they send me all these things. I don't have time to watch all of that. I don't, you know, I I vote for for my friends or what's prestigious. Or uh, how do you say it? My friends, well, you know, what, what's prestigious or like whatever's like trendy or popular. And it's like, got it. <laughs> okay. Speaking of uh, when Spielberg comes up, mm. uh, especially when he comes up on uh, uh, pop culture breakdown. Yeah. Um, I, um, I ask the question. Uh, I say, ask Steven Spielberg who killed Heather O'Rourke. And, um, one time I did that, Cameron Pasha responded to me, that is a dangerous question. Whoa. Interesting. Yeah. I'm, I'm not surprised. Mm. Well, that's a... And it's the only yeah. time Cameron said anything directly to me, so it was it really stuck with me. <laughs> that's a dangerous question. Whenever he brings up his imam, I always tell him, imam always liked you better. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Oh, but yeah, no. The, Cameron, uh, Cameron Pasha is great. He I'm is going to be uh, uh, getting a phone call from him on Friday. His, his any stream he's in, yeah. his contribution is usually really, really worth the price of admission. Oh, oh and speaking of which, he'll be on Masters of the Genre on the twenty eighth. Very good. Yeah. And I'll, I'll get, get to him tell him that Emma always liked him better. That's good. That's good. And yeah, he is, uh, you know, not not necessarily a Hollywood insider, but he's been part of the the game, you know, in Hollywood for mm. twenty years. Something well, he's like an that. insider to the extent he knows what's going on in Hollywood, and he yeah. hints at it a lot. Yeah. 
Mm. I'll be interested mm. to see what his feedback on my uh, my my treatment and my, the couple of scenes that I sent him. Uh, no question, to, he'll uh, be helpful. But uh, yeah, he's, he, helpful. He's very knowledgeable and... by telling me, you know, what he thinks, where 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 he thinks it should go, or by telling me, you know. He'll have Where constructive criticism one way or the other. <laughs> that I can guarantee. Yeah. That's who he is. Yeah, I'm a member of his uh, Patreon. I agree. He's, uh, uh, he, he, that's exactly right. He's always, when he says something, he's always trying to make it better. So that's, that's the writer in him. Sure. Yeah. But, oh, but uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we derailed the, uh, uh, conversation from uh, i station zebra because yeah, i love zebra we uh uh there were a, a couple times just recently at uh, one of our we have a group of people over every friday and we do movies and again someone meant we i forget how it came up someone mentioned about it and that's yeah, so why i've never seen i station zebra and i was like you've never seen i station zebra sit down lights can't you know, get, get right. the disc and you know in, it, and in minutes we're watching it just for patrick mcguin's performance it's, oh it's yeah i oh, have uh, God, yeah. many times Many times at uh, uh, when I back when I had a mm. job, uh, mm. would uh, would be challenged about my level of knowledge about a thing, and mm. my my response was always, "I know how to wreck them." <laughs> the only uh, a, special feature on the you know about submarines yeah. that I have of I Ice Station yes. Zebra uh, is a featurette about the uh, the vintage. Vintage making of featurette, the man who makes the difference. And there's a theatrical trailer. Yeah, yeah. it's the man who makes the difference. I believe that's about the cinematographer, isn't yeah. it? Or no, yeah, is that, that's, that that's about the, the, uh, that's the, uh, the documentary I was talking about. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, because, it, yeah, because they, uh, I mean, nowadays we take it for granted, but back in the 60s, he'd built this beautiful camera. So they actually filmed the ship, this, you know, the submarine. Right. Uh, going up he's and, a former Navy diver, and oh, he, yeah. he pioneered all these techniques for getting shots of the mm -hmm. ship. Mm -hmm. None of the none of the ships he took shots of, by the way, were skate class. But <laughs> yeah, well, no, it's uh, that was Cold War still a no no. I think to to show the best. Well, the, well, um, the, again, the model the model you see under the water that is yes. a skate class, and yes. you're supposed to believe the sub is a skate class. Um, it's, and, and it's telling the skate is not the most modern American sub at that point by any mm. stretch of the imagination. It's, no. it's largely been superseded by the skipjack and the skipjack's already getting long in the tube. But that's why I argue that's why it's in the movie because it's not the latest and greatest of anything, but it's capable I, of doing all of these things that we see, although maybe not in exactly the way they're presented. Because again, to come up through the ice, you got to find a thin spot. Now I don't know how thin I don't know those specs. I I I I expect that those used to be classified and I don't even know if that data is available to the general public today. Maybe with a FOIA request, I don't know, but I've never bothered. Mm -hmm. But yes. yeah, you you can't again because the pack ice is basically think of a, a whole bunch of icebergs pushed together. That's what the pack ice is. You're well, looking for it, the gaps. They kind of showed that in the film yeah. when uh you know Oh, yeah. Patrick McGoon gets stuck and yeah. the, the, in the crevasse, I guess yeah. the mm -hmm. icebergs or whatever you call them are kind of moving together yeah. and apart. Right. That's one um, of the dangers of the pack ice is that is that there's there's crevasses mm -hmm. like that everywhere yeah. and you can fall in them and you're done, you know. Oh, yeah. They, when they're walking along. Yeah, that's the thought I'm talking about when the uh, I, uh I was always thinking with the submarine up there when the ice starts to crush in on it, they got to, they got to yeah. pull out. Cause that would be, yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, no, do I, want I think in the to, sound stage um, when they had the conning tower up there, the mm -hmm. pieces of styrofoam were too thick, I think. <laughs> yeah. But again, it, yeah, not a big deal. It's, it's, it's the need. You need, you need, uh, I mean, realistic ice is great, but if it's, it blows away when, uh, when the wind machine goes, you know, you gotta, yeah, it doesn't exactly. do the thing. So you gotta, you gotta have it uh, stay there. You know? Yep. I uh, I do want to um, uh, talk about uh, gillstore dot com. Yes. For a minute, otherwise my mods will kill me. Um, we have all kinds of merchandise uh, available. Uh, we have uh, the pint glass, 
and uh, the black and the white coffee cups and uh, these great uh, hoodies, one of which I'm wearing and all kinds of other stuff and uh, today is the last day that the I Am Not a Number merchandise will be at, you know, pennies above cost. So uh, if anybody out there uh, has been, you know, wanting to get one, today's the day. Tomorrow the prices go back up. Well, I've been so. laying hints for family members. We'll see what, they, what they're saying. Yeah. <laughs> but and, thank you for doing um, that. That's, a, that's been very gracious of you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and uh, as uh, Gap Stargate has mentioned, uh, today our giveaway mm. is uh, the box set of Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles, both, uh, both seasons. And it's uh, brand new in the shrink wrap. Whoa. So, and it's got summer glow in it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'll be honest. I watched it for her, but the 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 show was surprisingly good. I thought it was going to be just cash grab trash, and it was actually better I, thought I out than the other movies. That's how I, I felt about it too. Yeah. Better than all but two of the Terminator films. Mm. My second and, favorite of her um, series on television. Yeah. Um, oh, Summer? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, a really great show. And uh, I I was really mm -hmm. shattered when they, they said that they, you know, were canceling it because for the first time in the Terminator franchise... At that point, we were going to go into the future in the third season. They were, you know, getting ready to go through the portal into the future. And I, you know, I've always wanted the Terminator to go into the future where John Connor is the, is the leader of the resistance and, and see, you know, all the great special effects that, you know, James Cameron sort of tried to do at the beginning of uh, uh, T2, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. he got away with it pretty well, but uh, with today's special effects, or, or even back then, uh, it would have been much better. Um, but it's a great series, so. <laughs> That's uh, yeah, I agree with Greg2600. Yeah. Uh, great show, got the usual Fox treatment, dumped too soon. Mm-hmm. I, at a convention once, I saw a button that was about this big, and it said, I'd rather be watching shows canceled by Fox. And then the, in the background, <laughs> it was just all the, the names of all the different shows. Um, by the time I went back to the, the table, it was gone. I haven't seen it since, but I need to get that because that's, yeah. that's the truth. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, so what we're going to do, we can, we can continue to talk if you like, uh, but I want to do the giveaway and get that out of the way. Okay. So, um, Ari, I'm going to have you pick a number uh, between uh, 1 and 10. Okay. And then I want you to psychically, you know, put it out there into the chat and... Um, yeah, anybody that you want a whole number, chat, right? What's that? Yes, a whole <laughs> number, an integer, as it were. Sorry, math professor. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> and anybody that's in the chat that's interested in uh, winning the giveaway this week, just put a number between one and ten in the chat, and that includes everybody on the panel except three. Yeah, I I want to give away once by guessing pi. <laughs> All the numbers, yeah. yeah. Well, somebody, the, the number was, I think the number was three. Somebody guessed four. They tried to give it to somebody else, and I was like, uh, 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 uh. Oh, and by the way, the, the numbers go into the regular chat as opposed to the private chat. Oh. My, what, okay, where am I? Oh, there we go. Okay. I didn't so even Cam, know. Yeah. Cam picked eight. 
Hurt 130 picked 7. Who who doesn't like pie? Uh, Greg 2600 <laughs> picked 3. The anticipation is killing me. And so tell me when you want me to reveal what my choice was. I will. Okay. Uh, Michael, did you get your number in there? I'm not even sure how to do this. I, I clicked it's, over to comments. Go to, com and, go to comments, yeah. the top one. Yeah. And then you can post it in the bottom uh, box there. Yeah, you know, I scroll down. The bottom box is already filled. I don't see any. Yeah, you can't do box. that in StreamYard. You'll have to go over to YouTube to do it. Yeah. That's, okay. Well, in that case, then just make sure you mute the mic. Well, I mean, I've got YouTube on while we're doing this. I just have the sound turned off. Yeah. Yeah, I have that, that that tab muted now. There you go. I. I See, you, you taught me something even this time. I didn't know that that was the deal. Yeah, I think you have to be uh, either the owner or, or I don't know if there's an admin function. It's but, saying log in here, so I suspect that might be involved. But for us, mm. but for us ordinary mm. uh, guests, yeah. I don't believe the option to go directly from StreamYards to chat is available. Mm. Uh, just another red shirt. Did you get your number in? Cam Cam. Gap Stargate. Yvonne, you got yours in, right? No, no, I'm not entering for this one. Oh, okay. Hmm. And so uh, this is the price is right rules. Hmm. It's uh, the closest without going over. Uh, so again, anybody that would like to participate in the giveaway put a number between one and ten that hasn't already been chosen into the chat and in 30 seconds we'll wrap it up okay. and uh ask Gary what what the number that he's been psychically projecting into the chat is And so was that is, correct? Uh, the stress is on the second syllable. What's that? On, on, on your brother's name, right? I I knew yes. somebody who spelled their name that way, but they stressed the first syllable. Everybody else is Where is stressing the second syllable is properly slotted. Ari, yes. Yeah. Everybody else is Ari, yeah. and I asked my dad once, why is it that everybody else pronounces it Ari and and we pronounce it Ari, and he said they all mispronounce it. Right, because yeah, the well. Slavic pronunciation would be Ari. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, it's a, technically it's a Hebrew name, but yeah. his parents were both Russian, so right, yeah, exactly, or Ukrainian anyway. The Ukrainian. Ooh. One of my yeah. one of my best friends growing up was from was his family was from Ukraine. Ah. Cam Cam says I am number eight. <laughs> Nicely done, Cam Cam. All right, so for the big giveaway. Ari, did anybody get the number? And the number of the counting shall be three. Three. And that would be... Five is right out. Greg, Five 20, is right out. <laughs> Very good. Two, shalt thou not count, not count neither count thou four. <laughs> the number of the counting shall be three. Congratulations, <laughs> Greg2600. Uh, you've won the giveaway. Mm. Congratulations! Yes. So I can the other, send the other funny both of them is, in the same box. The other funny thing is, as well. in the Dark Ages, they're reading scripture that sounds like it was written uh, in the King James version. <laughs> yeah, yeah, always. Um, yeah, that's every time travel movie ever. It's like yeah, they we can just talk. It's like yeah, no, I think so. But mm. yeah. Oh yeah. Or we can sit there and you have a five-hour movie for the first three hours. They figure out how to talk or something. Right. Are, are you, you know, familiar no. with the, the British <laughs> television series Cat Weasel? 
No, no. I've heard of it. Oh, it's uh, it's hilarious. Um, there were only two seasons of it, and the premise is a wizard who lives in basically Dark Ages mm -hmm. Britain is transported in time to the present, and the present in this case is 1971, I think. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, of course, he speaks English. <laughs> sort of He's middle english yeah. no no but in the series right he speaks english well enough i mean there's there's always confusion over over some terms but generally he speaks english well enough to communicate completely yeah no. he just doesn't yeah that one but it's 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 a, it's a kid's show so it's not something oh, taken yeah. too seriously yeah. there you go well kids want to have their disbelief suspended too. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. they didn't go in, but they didn't go into the language issue, which. But you know, it's like, uh, you know, in Star Trek, they have the universal translator. In uh, Doctor Who, anyone mm -hmm. that travels through time in the TARDIS automatically right. uh, understands right. yeah. everything that everyone else says, regardless of what planet they're on or in what time, right, uh, or what country. Yeah, and there's plenty of other you know devices like that. the hitchhiker's guide has the babel fish exactly yep. which makes sense yeah yeah better than you know universal translator or or yeah universal you know. translator is one of those you take it for what it is because if you don't there's no series it's the same mm -hmm. way i feel about warp drive uh, no, actually, I know people that are working on that. That's real, but uh, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, <laughs> so. it is. But I, I there's well, that's, that's like uh, well. So how do the transporters work? Uh, very well. Yeah, well, they, they yeah. Yeah. Up no, that one. yeah, that transporters. Yeah, I always thought that always struck me as being so such an incongruous technology to the rest of it. That that was like a, their first benefit of alien contact. They meet some yeah, people. They save them kirk or somebody saves them from some some menace it was purely, and they go here you go yeah. it was it was it was purely a budget issue oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah totally. they, they, they couldn't just, show shuttles and, going up and down all and, the time and and i i i like it best when they just sort of say okay we have this transporter technology now let's ignore it let's not let's not talk about it Let's not make it central to the plot. Actually, what? they did and explore that. Let's not that. save everything with it. Yeah. I, 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 I hate, did I hate when they do that. that in Enterprise. Yeah, I know. I know. And they did they did some episodes that had to do with uh, cool cool new things <laughs> we can do with transporters because they don't exist in uh, TNG as well. Yeah. Yeah, I got to the point where in TNG they would have you know forty minutes of dilemma and whatnot and then they would finally decide to call engineering and Jordy would go oh well we'll just run them through we'll the transporters the transporter run them back everything would be cool transporter can do just about anything yeah well yeah, that and, was in just... the TNG they used it to screen out any uh, bacteria or, or mm -hmm. well, discovered that people mm -hmm. may have uh, they discovered mm -hmm. the cure for cancer then i mean this is great exactly. yeah anything yeah. that wasn't there when they left they screen it out and so you right. come back as good as when you left no matter what happened except little your cheesy. memories are a little cheesy yeah are yeah. unchanged yeah and hello lawrence martin mm. greg 2600 says pattern buffers, pattern buffers. It. Mm. <laughs> yes and uh don't don't forget to isolate the secondary confinement beam Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, don't, yeah. don't cross the confinement beams have you ever downloaded one of those trick techno babble generators they've got one where you just push a button and it spews out uh you know, the technical sounding dialogue and you swear that the writers themselves were just using that toward the end of the show actually um in the next generation the mm -hmm. writers would write captain the tech is teching and then Michael and Denise Akuda would fill in the actual science later. Well, that's better than I, I mean, I, I can accept right. There are certain there are certain things you have to have to have a science fiction series make any sense, and I, I just sort of take them, despite the fact that I don't I don't believe in them. But um, at least um, yeah, you should ask somebody. Can we make? Can we at least? Can we make this sound believable? Because the the thing you don't want to end up doing is trying to tell people that you're using sonar in space. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, don't. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's painful even to hear that. You see, you see the phaser on my wall behind there. Yeah. They, I, yeah I'm a, I, like you. I, I first heard about no, no, yeah, no, sorry, yeah. from a guy I was working with and, uh, and he, he, he had, he had watched it. And so he was telling me the plot and how ridiculous it all was and about all the garbage technology. And I'm laughing and going, that's just not Star Trek. Oh, and no. then no. about two weeks later, somebody on Gab linked me to to Doomcock's first video yes. where he was roasting <laughs> Star Trek yes. Discovery. Oh, he yes. was so And Doomcock had like 3,000 followers at the time. And wow. it was back when he's like, well, I make sure to read and respond to every comment. It's like, well, that's not going to last. Mm-hmm. Not with 290-some subscribers. Uh, um, once he got up above 10,000, it wasn't possible anymore. So you know. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but yeah, so I, fortunately, I've had enough people, quote unquote, spoil the episodes for me. I don't know how to spoil something that's so rotten, but spoil the episodes for me that I don't have to watch the damn things, which is good. Good stuff. I'm, I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially with Discovery and Picard. Uh, oh, God. I found that after watching Picard, I couldn't go back and watch TNG. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've well, avoided it for that reason. Yeah. Here's it, the thing I'll, I'll say really about really affected my head cannon. Thing I'll say about about Kurtzman Trek is this, mm-hmm. and it's um, not everything that ever gets made. All right, not everything that ever gets written is literature. Not everything that ever gets made is going to be remembered. Um, I can't even tell you how many playwrights were running around England when Shakespeare was active, mm-hmm. but we only know one or two of their names because the rest of them were turning out garbage that was forgettable. Right. And I don't know if 20 years is the right time window or 30 years, but 20 or 30 years out from now, literally nobody is going to be watching or caring about Star Trek Discovery. Almost nobody watches it now. Yeah. But watching or caring, that's already pretty down to a minimum at the moment. Right. That's, that's Uh. just it. So, I mean, just, you can just imagine, yeah. How few people will give a damn about this because it's not good, right? One of the one of the one of the features that makes literature literature is it's so good people want to keep consuming it, right? right? And this is why we have Shakespeare and we don't have the work of most of these other playwrights who existed when he existed. We don't even know most yeah. of their names. Yeah. And and so you know, I don't I'm unhappy that they're making crappy Star Trek and it's preventing people from making good Star Trek, which in which I include fan films because the fan films that were available before that trash came out were a hundred times better. The yeah. worst fan right. film was a hundred times better than any of this shit that Kurtzman has done. Hell and yes. Better than anything Kurtzman will ever do. Which yes. Are but still available but, on, on YouTube. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, again, 20 or 30 years from now, all of Kurtzman stuff will be forgotten because it's not good enough for people to care about going forward. Oh, it's worse the than only not hope good it enough. Has, it's actually painful, and I think. The only hope it has is if, it's, if it becomes something that's so bad it's funny, right? So Plan 9 from Outer Space is, is really part of the culture because it's so awful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But with STD, I mean, they, they spend a lot of money they have whiz bang special effects, but so they don't have that. They're not cute by being somebody took a couple of oscilloscopes and put them on a desk. And that was the, con- that was the control station for a spacecraft. Yeah. They don't have that. They're not cute in that way, like plan nine from outer space. So they're not going to, they're not going to win on that score. They don't have anybody who will likely ever be considered a, a great actor in it. So it's very unlikely people will go back and, oh, hey, let's go see Shaniqua Martin Green when she was just a TV actress. And it's not going to happen because she's never going to progress beyond that. Well, um, actually, well, in Discovery, there is one actor, and I feel horrible because I met him at a convention before this, before Discovery launched. And it's, uh, oh, my God, uh, I'm trying to, uh, Jason Isaacs, and a uh, great guy personally, but, uh, uh, hugely, unfortunately, political, and he uh, uh, was going on about this. And so he he is a larger name, but of course they, uh, to my understanding, they kind of minimized him in the show. I, I've never 
I haven't watched enough to find out. But yeah, he was telling us all about how great this new. I thought, oh wow, they're bringing Star Trek back in the new Star Trek show. And I'm thinking, well, Jason Isaacs, this guy's great. So if he's leading the the cast, this has a real possibility. And we find out, no, he's just a he's a. a no, there's no way they'd let a man know. lead the cast. Yeah. Mean? Oh no. Well, we didn't know at the time. Neo he, Maoists don't do that. It's that's yeah. not how it is, right? Oh uh, yeah. No, he didn't. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't realize at the moment. This was just him talking to a Planet Comic Con yeah. uh, group. But uh, yeah, you're absolutely right in retrospect. One sec. Yeah. So so I don't. I'm not too worried about it. You know, when uh, when they say ruining the culture, I'm like, well, you know, the culture is made up of those things you accept. Mm -hmm. The stuff you reject never becomes part of the culture. So if enough people reject this garbage, and if you look at the viewer numbers in STD, that's where we are, it'll never become part of the culture because it'll be so completely niche. I mean, it'll be, it'll be as considered as weird to like that show as it was to like anime in the early 80s. I would I, say I even almost problem, nobody though. knew what anime <laughs> was in the early 80s. The difference is, of course, anime is good, but yeah. the point is it's niche. There's yes. only a certain number of people who are ever going to think Star Trek Discovery is good, and the people it's meant to appeal to don't watch science fiction because they, they don't get it. So, hmm. it's not no. going anywhere. No. Well, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not good enough to be good, and it's not bad enough to be good. Uh, it's, yeah, you're right, just in this, this meh zone. Well, you, you make stuff that's just insulting, it doesn't become a timeless classic. It, it oh, is yeah. actually, um, uh, what was it that you said, Michael? Well, it's, just, it's not, not good enough to be good, not bad enough to be good. Because it's like, uh, uh, man, if you ever watched like Manos, The Hands of Fate on right. MST3K, things like that, where they're so awful that uh, that they're, they're yeah, have entertainment value. Hard to watch, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want yeah, to with, uh, with Star yeah, Trek Discovery mm -hmm. uh, when they they release a promo shot of Sinequa Martin Green holding a phaser that's pointed toward her. <laughs> um, yeah, that uh, had to go I'm through going, shoot, the shoot. editor. <laughs> that had to go through yes, the cinematographer fire. or uh. the the P and E guys, the guys that do the publicity. Uh, you know everything, director, producer. And nobody I, caught it. I'm guessing the nobody below, knows what the fuck they're doing on that show. I'm guessing the below the line employees on that show hate the above the line employees so much mm -hmm. that they that they want them to make fools of themselves. Because from what I've heard, being being on that uh, the rumors I've heard is that being on that production is a very negative experience. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised. So I wouldn't be surprised if the if the if the below the line employees who are just trying to earn a living. Mm. Are, are are having a grand old time kind of letting <laughs> letting the people in this production make complete fools of themselves what game of thrones season eight and a, a coffee cup left on the so, table you know oh, somebody they, saw yeah. that somebody put that Star starbucks cup there on purpose. yeah and it or probably nothing. was not amelia clark yeah. no. or maybe it was i don't know mm. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that was her goodbye present you know because i tell you i mean i've worked places where um i was perfectly happy to let the boss make a fool of himself right oh um, yeah and i've worked other places where i would go out of my way to stop the boss making a fool of herself but that sure. was because when i had a good boss which mm -hmm. was only once in a while um but when you have a good when you have a bad boss it's like yeah go out and make a fool of yourself i won't laugh out loud but i will laugh <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, well, no, that's the deal. Is that uh, fortunately some of the bosses uh, haven't had too many bad bosses, but the ones I've had, if you do let them make a fool of themselves, they're going to do their best to make sure that that rains down on you somehow. But that's another story. Yeah. Uh, but you know the uh, uh, kind of getting back to the uh, the topic of today's chat. I was oh, going to yes. ask uh, you guys uh, what your favorite submarine movie is, starting with a re and going uh, clockwise. Um, and, of course, you, you can't uh, answer the same as the previous answers. My favorite submarine movie. Well, I don't know. Um, 
I've only seen Das Boot once, so, um, you know, and I've seen all those old World War II films lots of times. Hard to pick a favorite. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm Das Boot, maybe. Um, uh, I just, I like, I like submarine movies. That was um, good. Yes. Yeah, I, I like, uh, you know, you you roll You're out of one man's great. bunk and roll into another. It's a great line. Oh, Hunt for Red October. Yeah, Greg 2600. Mm -hmm. uh, great, great submarine movie. Absolutely, yeah. Um, that they're, they're all, you know, they all have a lot of those same components and just that whole. I mean, you get automatic tension, right? You're in a submarine. You know, you got 400 guys in a tube. Yeah, it's there's tension small right, right away. So yeah, it makes for good, good storytelling. Yvonne. Well, I mean that's what I would have picked, except that I would note that it wasn't originally a movie; it was actually a, a series in Germany. In mm -hmm. Six hours down into a single <laughs> film. Yeah. Hmm. So um, even the extended cut, which I I think I have a copy of. Even the extended cut isn't the whole thing. So, hmm. God, I mean, you know, that's probably something else. So, so in a sense, it, you know, yeah, it was released in the U.S. as a movie, but I don't know if it counts as a movie even. Fair enough. Um, but I would have picked it if it did, right? So we'll move on to something else then. Um, notwithstanding this film that we just watched, which well, is mean, one of my it favorites. It was released as a film. Here. Which is one of my favorite spy films. Um, I think if, if submarine viz submarine film, I'd have to give it to the enemy below. Mm. Yeah. Okay, Michael. Well, since I've been little, uh, there's one that I've watched repeatedly. It's good old uh, uh, Frankie Valley singing, "Come with me on a voyage to the bottom of <laughs> the sea." Um, yeah, I had about. Like, I've had like a dozen of the the Sea View models. I've actually got you uh, room behind me. I've got a poster of the blueprints on the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, loved the sub. Um, and again, I was too too young when the series was originally on to really understand how, how bad it was. So I just like the blinky lights. But mm -hmm. uh, but I'm really I'm conflicted because that that's why I think I had to give that one the number one slot. But actually, there's one that I would give a little higher. But it's I don't think it's technically there's a submarine in it, a fantastic voyage. Oh, sub in yeah. it, but that's not really a submarine really movie, movie as much. Yeah, not really. But uh but yeah, that one I love that of course uh, uh and then of yeah, course, also Erwin uh, Allen. No, the that was uh, voyage. No, that was 20th Century Fox, but the designer was the same guy who did uh the man who invented steampunk. Uh that was uh, he did the Nautilus for uh, Twenty thousand leagues under the oh, sea. Okay. Yeah, yeah, stuff, which uh, should be on the list, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's a that would yeah that would be if it wasn't going to be uh, voyage, it would have been that one. But yeah, yeah Disney's Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea is is one of those movies. I, I was I, I saw it as a kid in the theater and mm -hmm. it was oh, blown yeah. away by it. And it was a re-release because mm -hmm. you know I think it origin I forget when it originally uh, was released. Fifty four. And yeah. now we're back to James and, Mason, and, right? And I'm not that old, so James yeah, no, I saw Mason. it on I saw it on yeah. re-release in the seventies or late sixties, either one. I'm not sure which. But I'm just blown away by that film. I, I adored it. Oh. Oh, we had yeah, that that was one of the first ones we did at the uh museum that we had uh, we brought that movie back and uh we had uh uh again a big, beautiful print of it and the uh the sound system they just installed a new sound system we had a guy there was an actual organ in the theater so we had the guy playing bach before the before the the credits rolled he was actually playing the takana fugue it was fantastic and the contrast between that film and anything disney court puts out today <laughs> oh, i mean it's but, like it's yeah. like comparing a, a five star a five star restaurant to uh you know uh uh, your local uh, taco, taco bell yeah <laughs> taco yeah. bell yeah yeah i have a question yeah. about voyage to the bottom of the sea can the van <laughs> allen belts actually count catch on fire <laughs> um, <laughs> van allen belts no but we're you know i got i got scared when i started wrong, looking at hydrogen bomb experiments and that was a concern is that they would start a fusion reaction 
that would start mm-hmm. literally the that the atmosphere would go up like a like a torch and it's yeah. like oh and you blew it up anyway good thank you <laughs> great you know yeah well they were the best physicists in the world i i, I mean yeah our, our germans were better than their germans <laughs> Well, yeah, the first the first test though is like, okay, we expect a yield of about this much, so we'll put all the facilities out here. And then when it blew out to here, it's like, yeah, there was, yeah, there, was you know, there was definitely you, a certain you, amount of guesswork because you just didn't have yep. you didn't have enough no. data, right? No, I mean, no, no. There are still areas, uh, especially in nuclear medicine, where you just don't have enough data. You don't, you don't have enough mm-hmm. people who've been affected in order to actually know what the behavior is. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, Irwin Allen had the pulse of like the modern film goer. As long as it looks cool, and uh, you know, it doesn't as long as it's not uh, uh, too offensively uh, illogical, you can get away with a lot. Yeah. Well, yeah, the flying sub, right? Flying sub for the win. And, yeah. As a kid, I loved that sub. As an adult, I say, "Yep, they're all dead." The second that thing hits the water, <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you know, it looks cool. I played a video game back in the eighties where mm. where laughed the whole time. Great. Oh yeah, Herc mentioned one uh, Operation Petticoat. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, Yvonne, mm. your your audio dropped out. Can you repeat? Oh, what was I talking about? <laughs> Uh, you said your favorite when you were a kid. You mean Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea? That's... Either that or the the comment after that. Yeah, well, I, I was know. talking about the last thing I was talking about was uh, I had a I, I had a uh, a computer game in the eighties. That that was it. Oh yeah, a computer game in the eighties, and one of the vehicle types was flying subs. <laughs> and I just sure. laughed the whole time because I'm like, was that a, a Commodore 64 game or something? No, no, it was a PC game. It was oh. called Midwinter Two. Oh, I heard of that. Mm-hmm. There's actually an Irwin Allen chat the other day, and people were saying, "Well, where did they get the idea of the flying sub from?" And I quickly brought up this picture. You had uh, uh, Jacques Cousteau's uh, Dennis was, was the yellow. Hemisphere, you know, the kind of flying saucer looking like sub, and you had her hanging it from a crane, getting ready to lower it in the water. And it's like mm. it was a perfect match. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's where they got it. I took one look at that and said, Oh, that's cool. Uh, yesterday on YouTube, I saw an exact model of that, except it was red on the bottom. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, uh, and as for me, I think yeah. because I saw it in the theater. Um, my favorite uh, submarine movie is The Hunt for Red October, which uh, two of you mentioned, but not as your favorite. Um, and I also like uh, U-571. Mm-hmm. That was okay. Actually, there's a lesser known one that I've come to really appreciate. Uh, there's a movie called Below. If you can look it up, it's, uh, it was like, I don't know if it was straight to video, but it was uh, early 2000s. And it's a, an actual, it's one of those where they kind of fuse genre. So it's a World War II submarine movie ghost story. Hmm. And it doesn't sound like that would work well, but it's got, uh, oh, I'm trying to, the, uh, the main actor's really good. And it, uh, it's got a great cast, but the, I was just amazed. I, I w- started watching this thing and it was, uh, do, they pulled it off very well. One second. Yeah. 2002. Yeah, it was. Uh, so you've got the. Uh, yeah, Bruce Greenwood. And also supporting Astro. Yeah. Yeah. He was spectacular in it. Um, he's a, uh, I mean, it starts out a stressful situation before the beginning of the film, something they've you got a sub that's just come off of an engagement. The captain got killed. Uh, Greenwood's the first officer. He's in charge. And then they've got to they get, a, get ordered. They're trying to get into port and they got to go back at a rescue mission. 
to uh, to this British hospital ship. And the thing is that one of the, the patients, the nurse, or the, she's got like a couple of patients that she got off this sunken ship. One of them's a, a German officer. She's trying to keep that quiet. Otherwise, she thinks that they'll, and they're right, they'll throw this guy out the airlock. But then uh, weird things start to happen, and it just gets very interesting. So it's like, if like a below. supernatural, yeah, like below 2002. So it's like I supernatural and, yeah. yeah. You know what I saw The Abyss like. recently, and it's not oh, technically a submarine movie, but has all uh, of the same elements in it, right? Yeah, I forget. You're right. I should have thought of that. That's, I love that movie for on a totally different level. I don't think it was a submarine movie, but that was awesome. We, we also saw that one in the, uh, the uh, Cinerama Theater. Have you seen the director's, the original director's cut before they, they chopped it up on him? I, I don't know which one I've seen. Okay. Uh, uh, have you seen uh, the one which with... Which movie? The Abyss. At oh, the end, have you, have you seen where the tidal wave comes up over the... Okay. The Abyss, the original cut, the aliens are not helpless. In fact, they probably would have... Uh, maybe got a little ticked off at a nuke being uh, exploded on them, but they weren't really concerned. Mm. Um, at the, so at the end of the film, when they decide to, to reveal themselves, they can't stay hidden anymore. They mount or march a thousand foot wall of water off of every shore coastline in wow. the Americas. Yeah. Everybody's looking, you see like the, the golden gate bridge, you see this wall of water come up behind it and it just stops. So they put it up there, they stop, and, and the message is clear. It's like, you, you know, you, you guys aren't, you guys can't play on our league. And then they, they want demonstration of power. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. so yeah. And I think somebody thought that somehow, I mean, they respect uh, our hero's sacrifice going down, sacrificing his life to do, I think he was saving them from, from destruction. And that's what, uh, what prompted them. But uh, I guess that was too intelligent for uh, mm -hmm. the powers that be. So now we've got to cut that out. That People don't get it. You know. Yeah, it's that was... Bad. Oh, it did is. They, it's a, did they film that yeah. ending? Yeah, yeah. It's a, we, cut, we saw it with that cut in. There was a special like presentation. My wife found out about it that day. So we just... Is it uh, available on disc? Yeah, it's... Uh, it's uh, I think it's on the... I mean, he's never even done a, a high-def version of it, but, uh, yeah, you can see the I'm, cut scenes. I'm pretty sure that that version has been shown on television yeah. mm -hmm. because I've seen that part of it. I've seen yeah. the, the massive wave, and I only yeah. ever watched it on uh, back before sci-fi became Siffy. <laughs> Siffy, indeed. Yes. Yeah. I don't wa I've never watched Siffy, so... Siffy isn't something you watch. It's something you go to the doctor to get cured. <laughs> you would think so. I don't know. I mean, I, yeah. About the time sci-fi became Siffy, I pretty much gave up on television completely. So, Which is weird because not long thereafter, they, they started The Expanse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's something I, uh, I watched uh, at the recommendation of... Uh, Doomcock and or Gary. I don't, I don't know which one I heard it from first. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I liked as much of it I watched. I haven't watched the last two seasons and I don't plan to because after what they said about the next to last season, I'm like, I'll pass. Yeah. I, I, I'll use my time in a different way. I got, I'm so far, far behind on reading books that, uh, you know. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, the, my room full of books is over that way. But yeah, same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Any of you all watch uh, 1883? I know it's a complete genre jump, but... What, uh, uh, is that no, HBO Max? Uh, it's on uh, Paramount Plus. Uh-huh. And oh, it's... Know that, yeah. um, what is the writer's name? Taylor Sheridan. Hmm. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's technically Plus. a prequel for Yellowstone, but it... Mm. I mean, I, I got hooked on 1883, and then I tried to watch the first episode of Yellowstone, and it was like, oh, no, they're nothing alike. Yeah. Hmm. Well, if it's, on, if it's on P+, Plus, it'll be on Pluto for free sooner or later. Yes, I think that's right. <laughs> you know, what I think is funny about Pluto TV is that, that I think, you know, based on the amount of commercial time, I think they must make more money showing reruns of PBS shows from the 70s and 80s mm -hmm. than they make showing 
uh, Star Trek Discovery. Hmm. Well, I mean, uh, what did they say on Netflix that uh, they they paid a million dollars to keep Friends yeah. for one more season? Yeah. Because it I was watched, the highest rated show on Netflix. I watched the hell out of their Julia Child channel. So, you know, and uh, they also have a Bob Ross channel. And they're still chock full of commercials. So they're obviously making money off these things. Mm. Yeah, mm. Greg, I kind of share your, your sentiment. Although I, I think that season four of The Expanse is the best... Uh, the best season uh the first three seasons were good but when they when they got onto amazon it really kicked into high gear and then not so much which is funny because you know they're amazon prime has some original content that's watchable and then they have they some have very this, watchable original content. Then they I'm have this thing they spent a billion, a billion dollars on. And in the yeah. trailer, they have demonstrated <sighs> that they purposely mean to go exactly 180 degrees different from what the author wrote. Well, they, they've already mm -hmm. got Carnival Row. And mm -hmm. I, I loved the first season. And I haven't heard anything about if and when a second season will uh, show up mm. uh, but Jeff Bezos said I want a Game of Thrones yeah, and I there's think he's very little that you can do <sighs> yeah. rather than totally bastardize Lord of the Rings for that that's why I started calling it Lot Got Lord of the Game of Thrones because that's what there it, it looks like it's going to be I'm going yeah. to borrow that that's okay I like that. That, that sums it up that's, that's one of my titles I have three titles for it it's that Zenadriel Warrior Princess. Is <laughs> I, yeah, I saw you do that one before too. And that's she's, that's and good. she's probably going to have a ginger sidekick for that one. So I don't know. Oh, and I then the other that. one is um, uh, uh, Laradriel Croft Ring Raider. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, it. that's. But but yeah. no, this uh, this Don Lemon lass is is them saying <laughs> whatever the author wrote, we want to do the exact opposite. It's, it's unambiguous that elves are fair skinned and have long flowing hair. So what do they got to do? They got to get a mocha skinned guy with a crew cut. That's not an accident. It's oh, no. not a misjudgment. They no, purposely, they read what he wrote and they said, let's do the exact opposite because we get to do it. Well, or, or because the politics from three years ago when we started this thing, yeah. Uh, were woke, and now yeah. everybody's going unwoke, and we can't reshoot and rewrite because we've already spent a billion dollars on it. If I could draw to save my life, I would do panels from from the whole story, and then read the whole story and just have the panels. And because what I would love to see <sighs> is just a word for word, scene by scene production of Lord of the Rings. Not something that worries about whether it's got good enough chase scenes or whether there's enough romance in it or whether we're diverse enough. Um, there's no, I noticed there's no rabbit chickens in it, so I don't know how to really <laughs> say it is. It's no rabbit chicken representation. Uh, I but, assume no, it was racist. You're yeah. talking about the Peter Jackson films, not the no, no, the uh, the new Amazon no, series. Yeah, no, I'm Amazon. talking about the new ones. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the 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 Amazon thing that is isn't Lord of the Rings by any stretch of the imagination. Because they're, they're in, in the Silmarillion, the appendices appendices contain no stories. There right. are locations, there are characters. No, what I'd uh, like to do, but there's is, no plot. What I'd love to see is just the Lord of the Rings, scene by scene, word for word. That's what I'd like to see. I'm never going to see it from this movie industry. You, you know that. Um, but I, I, it's the sort of thing that um, just some, some somebody who could draw and somebody who can read could do as a project, you know, and, and it would be beautiful. It would you know, take an illustrated audio book to, to see. Yeah. 
I, I you suppose know. you could do one where, I mean, there are so many illustrations by so many different artists from over the years that you could just collect them all and flash those up on the screen as you went. And hail Stephen Ernest. Mm. <sighs> there you go. Well, mm. that's, uh, that's, oh. yeah, I've, I've read it many times and I will, I will again, no doubt of it. Oh, I've read I, it in two different languages. So, mm. Talk to somebody well, under 18, it. Stephen. They, they don't have the imagination anymore. They've grown up with other people giving them images for everything. That's true. Uh, and so they, they uh, uh, lack the, the mechanics, which uh, really is, we should be very alarmed at that. But that's, that's what you see is they, they do 140, you know, tech or character tweets. Uh, they don't have a an attention span and they don't have the imagination. Well, well there you go. You just, you just use Google and yeah. you type in one sentence at a time and click images yeah. and then go. just record <laughs> that and then type in your sentence yeah. and hit image. I, I recently read idea. Dune when I heard they were going to make another movie. I'm like, I'll read the book. They can't ruin it for me. Yeah. yeah. Did you? Yeah. Just the first book. I, I didn't read the whole series. That's the only one you need to read. First book is where all the important stuff is. Yeah. Did anyone else consider it merciful when Frank Herbert did finally pass away? I was afraid. I mean, he kind of keeps kept, kept squatting out more, you know, Dune, well, but, and it's like I expected one day the did, cookbook right? of Dune, or yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It didn't. It didn't stop him. But yeah, it's just like it's like Paint guy. By you, numbers, you, yeah, Dune. Yeah, yeah. You you hit it on the first one. The first three. Are are in, among you know the pinnacle of science fiction. Stop, <laughs> please, yeah, please stop. Right. Uh, but well, that's, what, that's what that's how I felt about uh, uh, George Lucas making any more movies. <sighs> Go, like, no, just don't. You've done. Oh, you've don't. Done, you've done some of the greatest things ever made on film. Just stop. You want to hear? Here's my nightmare. Here's the thing that bothers it me. Could be any worse than what they're chucking out at Disney, and and that is true. Mm, too. True, but now here's the thing with George Lucas. I I missed the opportunity to meet him because he kept hidden. But the very night that he signed over and sold us all down the river to Disney, we were showing American Graffiti as our a movie event, and we had Cindy Williams there with us. Oh, that's great. And we, and and the thing is, my sister in law said, "Hey, when did you guys get George Lucas here?" I thought George Lucas isn't here. And then the uh, the uh, door of the projection booth gets knocked on. And there's a guy there in a suit because yeah, he's the limo driver saying, "Yeah, we need to get Mr. Lucas. To, is George in here? We need to get him back to the to the plane." Oh, he and was there. he was there. Someone got we got up with the, with their pocket with their phone. They took a shot in the uh, dark, and he was uh, he snuck up into the balcony. Because that was his private print. He he, uh -oh. as a favor. He that was his private print of uh, well. Bruce knows some ILM people, and uh, I mean you know they all they all love Harry Osen and, and uh, Harry Osen vouches for him. So yeah. everyone he was alive. But uh, but but that was the deal. And that was the night. And if I knowing now, if I would have known then, would have found him and grabbed him and screamed, "No, yeah, <laughs> don't yeah. do it." Kirk one thirty says it. Star Trek fifteen to yeah. search for yeah. more money. Yeah, I, yeah. I saw I saw American Graffiti in the theater, and that was before I had any idea who Harrison Ford was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, for anyone an idea, probably yeah. if it was early. Who yeah. I think uh, began in Judgment at Nuremberg. Is that right? Ju well, really? Who okay, Ford? I have to check. He must have been. It would have been pretty I, I've young. Seen, I, I've seen two. Th two films Harrison Ford did that were before American Graffiti. Uh -huh. One of them's, um, oh, I forget the exact title, but it has to do with the Battle of Shiloh. Something like The Road mm -hmm. to Shiloh. Mm -hmm. And he play, he is a very small part in that. And then there's another film where um, uh, who is it? Um some, he, he has a bit part in another story where the, the main character is a detective who's in who's who's figuring out um, about some city corruption and of course the corrupt city officials eventually get their revenge on him and Harrison Ford's in that too 
Yeah, and the Journey to Shiloh. This is an IMDb. Uh, yeah, he yeah, did yeah. mostly TV because, like, uh, the yeah. I saw I've got him in Love American style. Um, yeah, I don't remember him from that. No, you know, it was just an episode. They got yeah. the uh, he was he did like a one one little one offs. He was in yeah, Ironside, yeah. the Virginian. They had nothing big. Yeah, yeah, you know, a lot of TV actors got by on that. The Virginian, wow, he must have been 14 when he did that. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's, um, what, he's born in uh, 1942. And so oh. he would have been, he would have been 20. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's, he's exactly 12 years younger than my dad to the day. He's 80 wow. now. My, my late dad, I should say. Um. Oh. Hey, Andy, yeah, right he's he's older here. than I thought because then that would have made him what mid thirties or something in American Graffiti, right? So American Graffiti was seventy six, yeah. so so yeah, he would have been yeah. uh, thirty three or thirty four at that point. Yeah. Yeah, well, he was well, very well preserved at that point in his career because he he looked like the young heartthrob even then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm trying to uh, figure out what the movie was that I saw that he was very young in, but there are two judgments at Nuremberg, and only one of them is coming up. It, Cam Cam says that uh, he read The Hobbit at five and did a report on it, and uh, his teacher didn't believe him. Uh, it turned into a big deal, and antiderivative Jill says she doesn't understand teachers who don't support precocious students. And I got to say, as a career teacher, I'm I'm right there with you. It is okay. difficult if you've got a room if you've got a room with 35 kids in it. Um, it, that's my comment man, managing that room can be tough if you precocious students are very disruptive to the collective education model so well th yeah. this is this is absolutely true and i don't disagree with that but when you're in charge of managing that group at that moment that's a rough that's a oh, oh absolutely rough day that's at what the i'm saying it, it's it's yeah. the model mm -hmm. that they don't fit into Oh, Force 10 mm. from Navarone was what I was thinking. There you of. go. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. But um, well, that was, that was he, post Star he had done Wars. A lot by yeah, then. Uh, he was even in. Um, uh, well, Apocalypse Now was the one that he hurry up and did before Star Wars was complete didn't it? Is a, with uh, Coppola. And what did he? Mm. What did he have? One line or two? Yeah, just a couple. He just precocious uh, students yeah. were, shall we say, discouraged. Yeah. <laughs> was Sister that the ruler on the wrist. Uh, steel meter stick. Her name was Sister Jean go. Marie, and she w wielded the thing like a kendo master. <laughs> um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, the you know. Through high school, I went to Catholic high school. We didn't have a military school, so you had a bunch of privileged kids whose parents hadn't disciplined them, and they they uh, uh, threw them in there. And so you really couldn't let the precocious kids get away with much because it, uh, it, it their whole their whole thing was to make sure nobody else got an education. Ari, did you know that Harrison Ford was in the original Kung Fu? Uh at one point i may have i may have known that i don't know i'm sure when i was because i was a religious viewer of kung fu i'm oh, sure I when know. i saw him i didn't know who he was so yeah uh, i wouldn't have known it then sometime between then and now i may have figured it out but don't i'll have remember. to go back through my dvds and and watch that episode 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kung Fu, Kung Fu, the television show Kung Fu was my religion for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, I, I ha had a friend who lived in Chicago uh, that <clears throat> really hated Kung Fu, the legend continues, where oh, his son is a cop. Uh, mm -hmm. And he made jokes about uh, if they ever bring back Doctor Who, they'll have to bring, you know, his son onto the TARDIS who has a, a gun and is a cop. Don't laugh. <laughs> Somebody. Oh, God. <sighs> I don't think I ever watched one minute of uh, The Legend Continues. It wasn't bad. It, yeah, wasn't, it wasn't Kung Fu, but it wasn't bad. Yeah. yeah. That was like my comment, uh, somebody who's saying they love No Time to Die. I said, it's not a bad movie. It is in no way, shape, or form anywhere near a James Bond movie, but it's not a bad movie. <laughs> I'll, I'll go further. Um, I, in my opinion, the character that uh, Daniel Craig plays in yeah. the, all of those movies is not James Bond. It's the I, other yeah. character. Yes. It's, it's something it's, it's I don't Jason recognize. Jason Bourne. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, pretty much. So, so for, my, for my money, he never played James Bond. I'll second you on that one. Oh, well, I've seen the episode. Yeah, well, he's recognizable once you know who he is, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it'd be interesting to see, going back to that 1974 episode of Kung Fu that he appeared in, whether he, he had gotten that scar on his chin yet or not. That's a good point. Hmm. I I don't know if it's ever been released or mentioned how he got that scar. I mean, not. I've in, never heard in, in real life, not in movies. Yeah, well, I've heard some apocryphal stuff, but nothing. I don't can't recall Harrison Ford sitting down saying this is what happened to me. So, mm -hmm. I know in one of the Indiana Jones movies, he. He uses the, the whip, whole whip yeah, and it yeah. comes back and hits him in the in the chin. I think I remember that. Yeah, that was uh, that was the uh, 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 what's the Phoenix? What's his name? The uh, uh, playing young Yeah Jones in the uh, beginning of uh, the Last Crusade. Mm. But uh, hmm. yeah. Uh, not River is River Phoenix. Uh, yeah, the uh, yep. yeah the poor kid. Yeah. Uh, they're sacrificed to the to the uh, faint gods of fame. Well, I mean, yeah, it's too bad, but you know, you can't say it wasn't his fault. No, no, <laughs> no, no. Well, yes and no. I mean, you look at uh, kids like Drew Barrymore. I mean, that's a, more her parents' fault. Um, you got kids surrounded by adults that uh, are partying hard and. You know they they they, uh, they look really glamorous. And they look really attractive and stuff like that, and get caught up on it. I mean, how most people don't have those kind of opportunities. So I don't know if that's fair to say that it's uh, uh, all their fault or not. I think it's, I think it's some some fault to be spread around there. And there's some people that like to. Uh, I'll tell you this one. I mean, there are some people who just like to destroy other people who get off on on corrupting the innocent. So it's it's true and it's unfortunate yeah well yeah, some Ford, men just uh, like to watch the world burn uh, Harrison Ford's film I really liked was the Frisco Kid yes that was that was good the Frisco Kid yeah. we're uh, coming up on two and a half hours oh okay so what do you say we guys wrap up I, I'm Works. for it is there anything that you would like to plug, Yvonne? Uh, well, I'm just rebranding my channel. That's about it at the moment. Okay. Um, so if you look, uh, if you search on YouTube, I haven't put any videos up yet, but I have some mm. things. Uh, cool. I'm going to try to take full advantage of the algorithm. Uh, <laughs> Aha. I, 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 I did have, once upon a time, I posted videos. And there, I've taken them all down now. And hmm. um, I had this idea, I'm going to do these videos just like this. And it took me like two weeks to do a 15-minute video. So I'm like, <laughs> no, that's too much work. 
Um, so we're not going to do that anymore. And I, and I, you know, I'm so, um, my, yeah, you have to new... be like the history channel to be able to afford to do that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> my, uh, my, my channel I'm rebranding as the reluctant dragon. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And, uh, and so, uh, that's what you would, uh, you would look for if you were looking for it. Again, I haven't posted anything yet. Now, if we I'm sub... basically going to just yeah. try if to see if i can actually sit down and make one point and then get the hell out of town <laughs> and and that's how i'm, I'm going to approach this and we'll see if i can get gotcha. a video done here sometime soon okay yeah and if we've already subbed to you and it's rebranded do we have to resub or it just you shouldn't uh, have to no. okay cool no but i i just i i, I you know uh if you want to be anonymous call yourself ivan ivanovich <laughs> because if you search on YouTube for Ivan Ivanovich, I swear to you, you, you will find at least a hundred channels. Because yeah, the only thing I'm coming up with is uh, the Disney movie. Yeah, if you look for mm -hmm. channels, re the, the Reluctant Dragon, there might be one other hit you get. But I, I could be too small for you to get a hit on right now, for all I yeah. know, because I haven't posted anything, right? Yep. So when I start posting things, maybe. But yeah, so looking forward. I'm probably going to do some of. There are some tricks I've learned about how to brand your videos, each each individual, how to title videos, mm -hmm. title videos in absolutely preposterous ways to get to get YouTube to pick them up. It's so basically always talk bait. about the greatest or the whatever. If, mm -hmm. You know, use a lot of superlatives. Or I know this guy. You wouldn't he does, believe. Yeah. He does this stream and every and every one of them is titled. This is probably the greatest blankety blank, you mm -hmm. know, that's ever been. And. Yeah, you watch him and you realize he doesn't believe that. Ten he's, things about so and so. He's just streaming the game. But oh, if you Jill, don't call Jill it, has the this channel is right here. The Thank ultimate you, or the greatest, whatever it is, um, then you don't get uh you, you don't yeah. you don't get noticed by the algorithm. And it's all about Al Gore's rhythm. So Yeah. Because <laughs> he invented the internet. That's yeah, he right. did. Oh yeah. Yeah. So Gil, is this the formal end of I am not a number? Is yes. there going to be something that replaces this time slot going forward? Or Yes. Okay. I'll mm, make an okay. announcement on that later. Okay, we'll be looking. Uh, Michael, is there anything that you would like to plug? Well, just since we were mentioning it tonight, uh, my friend Bruce Crawford's website, it, uh, you can see uh, stuff we've done there. It's called omahafilmevent.com. And you can see uh, there's there's images from past events and guests we've had and, and movies and uh, and you definitely uh, Cardinal you're going to get a uh, a uh, notice once we have the the next but this is also if you just click on this it'll, it'll have a place for new events so once we get back rolling with that now that people don't have to wear masks and all that fun stuff yeah cool. I'll still wear one but <laughs> it's mostly just for everybody else oh oh. Well, that's, well, that's my favorite line from you. You saw the uh, Man from Uncle movie, right? The, uh, yeah. the my guy. Yeah. Yeah. I was about to say, do you wear a mask? So sometimes, only not when I steal. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Ari, do you have anything you'd like to plug? Uh, well, I, I don't really have a YouTube presence. Uh, I'm more of a consumer than a um, provider um, or, or creator, rather. So, uh, no, not really. I mean, you know, if you want to come watch me teach calculus someday, just, you know, pop on over to Kansas City. And uh, if the weather's really bad, I'll put it on Zoom, and then you could watch that. <laughs> All right. I might take you yes. up on that. <laughs> oh, it's riveting, let me tell you. Yeah. Well, as somebody who teaches calculus, I can relate. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, yeah. You know, we can always have Auntie Derivative Jill come in as a oh, yeah, there you guest go. lecturer. All right. Our calculus theme. I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally envious of you guys. I, when I went to school, I wanted to become two things: bilingual and a math mathematician, and I am a excellent English major. <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't even want to go into the number of hours I've spent studying languages and never, never develop a true facility with them because I just don't have access to the people. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm in real trouble now, but my buddy uh, married a Russian lady, so I, uh, I wanted to just learn Spanish, and that was more than uh, the circuits could, could uh, cope with. So, mm. uh, All just... you've got to know now is dos vidania. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you mean like for the next five minutes so that we can get, so that we can get out of here? Yeah, yeah uh, that which too. is yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. well, sorry. Yeah. Well, thanks for the invite. I've, I've, it's been fun. Yeah, thanks yes, for thanks coming for on. The First time I've ever streamed. Well, uh, Don did great. Used to say, Arrivederci, America. Arrivederci. So, uh, for uh, Ivan Ivanovich, Uri, Uri, and Michael, it's Cardinal Sin out. Be seeing you. Be mm -hmm. seeing you.